You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. We've got a lot of lot of stuff going on. You know, I'm at war with Adam Booth, um, trying to, you know, see out a, a management contract that, you know, uh, we're disputing. Uh, I feel like I've been robbed and fucked over by uh, Eddie Hearn, the promoter. I'm questioning his morals. What has he done? How has he had this involvement? Good, and he's a very good fighter, James Miguel. Very, very good fighter. Um, yeah, you're saying that you would never, I would never admit, <laughs> you know, uh, while we're while we're competing, because uh, it was always just, it always seemed better for me to put him down. Boxing saved my life. If, if, if it wasn't boxing, I'd be out <laughs> shooting and drinking and killing and this and that. And I was thinking, I don't know if I, I don't know if that would have been me if I wasn't boxing. When you're an underdog in these situations, um, I can't help myself, but feel that I want to convince the guy in front of me that you got it all wrong man you are you got it all wrong the fight takes a bit of a you know a bit of a slight dip of intensity but I'm still winning the fight and then obviously eighth round in my opinion like the referee jumps in and, and stops it for a, biz a bizarre reason yeah they rush him off to hospital uh he has a bleed on the brain I think they put him in an induced coma um probably operate on him uh, I go and visit him um, with Nissa Sowland say on the Wednesday maybe um, he's in Paddington Hospital in London and uh, yeah I mean he was he was like a shell of the man that he was Saturday it was for me crazy I couldn't believe that someone could deteriorate that much over four days Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got world champion boxer, George Groves. How are you, George? I'm good, thank you, James. Very good, very, very good. Looking well, brother. Thanks, yeah, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. I, uh, yeah, no, it's all, all's good, all's good. Great career. British title, Commonwealth, European as well, is that correct? Yep. And world title, mm -hmm. fourth time. Sorry for mentioning that. No, we're there for you. You got there. Sold out Wembley, biggest one of the well, not the biggest now, I think, few years, but the biggest fight in British history, like 80,000 people, unbelievable. And a uh, great career. I thought maybe it ended a wee bit too soon, but obviously, you're this your decision maker in your life, do you know what I mean? But first and foremost, how are you? I'm really good, thank you, really, really good. Um, happy, enjoying life, you know. Uh, yeah, and you know, for for a, for a period in boxing career, I wasn't sure that was going to be the case. But yeah, win win a, win a world title with the fourth attempt, um, and then yeah, the idea was to to finish sort of on my own terms, maybe with a little bit left in the tank. Could have gone again a couple of times, but felt nah, this is good. This feels right. Um, things had changed in my life. I'd had uh, two kids at this point and you know, wanted to be more present in their lives. So they were, they were brand new, two, two under two before my uh, before my last fight. So yeah, you know, um, I was ready to uh, to move away from boxing. And now I get, I'm lucky enough, I get to dip my toe in to boxing every now and again. I get to cover the fights, you know, if it be on TV or radio, I try and get down to boxing gym when I can to get that boxing boxing fix. Um, and that is just more than enough for me, James. That's more than enough for me. <laughs> I always go back to the start of my guests. Where you grew up and how it all began? Yeah, so um, a kid, and there was no boxing in my family. Um, I don't know, really, just sort of saw the Rocky movie as everyone else did. Uh, my dad was happy to push me into anything that I sort of showed a willingness for. Um, at seven, I was probably a bit too young to box, or at least that's what we were, we were told. So I started kickboxing. It was everyone else does, the cliche thing. I uh, was good at it, enjoyed it. Uh, at the age of 10, joined the local boxing club, uh, which was Dell Youth, uh, ABC, and did both boxing and kickboxing for a few years. And then from about 13 onwards, was just all in for my boxing. What made you choose boxing instead of kickboxing? Uh, I think I think I was probably aware that there was a future in boxing at that age, you know, rather than kickboxing where there, there just wasn't a future. I mean, this was early to mid 90s um, when I was there. You know, there was guys that were fighting on the pro circuit, but they all had jobs <laughs> to go with it. It wasn't like like now where I don't know, maybe if you've got 
a mixed martial arts background you can go into you know the ufc or mma or stuff like that but um then it was just yeah boxing boxing was on, was on telly what everyone knew about what was exciting and um yeah, I just, just always wanted to... Boxing Boxing had that, also that it just felt a little bit more structured. You know, you could go in the schoolboy championships and come out with something that felt a little bit more meaningful for me than, than kickboxing, which was just matching two guys up, attaching a belt to it, and sort of away you go. Who was your idols? Um, I never watched a lot of pro boxing as a kid, um, but obviously the, the era was like Nazim Hamid. Um, there was... Uh, you know, Eubank and Ben, um, Lennox Lewis, they were the guys that we were watching. Um, and then as I got a bit older, um, it was Ricky Hatton and Joe Calzaghe, really. You know, they were the ones that had the forefront of boxing when I was sort of early teens, mid-teens. Um, yeah, getting on the on the school bus and talking about the Ricky Hatton fight the night before. So, yeah, and this might, this was, you know, pre him fighting Costa Zoo and stuff like that. So they're, they're the guys that you're looking up to, you want to emulate and... Yeah, be in the future. What were you like at school? I was good. I mean, I was quite timid, to be honest. In the you know, um, in the real early ages, as a kid, I was quite shy. Um, not really, you know, didn't didn't get, get stuck in or amongst it. Um, sort of, I think I found my feet come you know thirteen years on onwards. So like year eight, I think is at school. Um, yeah, sort of. Then I'll probably come a bit obnoxious and a bit bit brash and a bit full of myself um school you know academically i was okay I, but it was always just enough to get by and um it was always boxing you know i always felt like i had the excuse of boxing i wouldn't be doing homework or coursework or revision or this or that and it even got to the point where i think yeah you do your gcse's in year 11 and i missed half the exams because i was boxing in texas or i was boxing in Dublin or something and it was great because I was like oh, I don't need to worry about doing this work because I'm not going to be there for the exam anyway um, but yeah uh, school I enjoyed school I quite I quite liked school um, I liked the the friendships you know I like I like like there's loads of people you know there's there's, loads, there's lots going on so I, I quite enjoyed that and I, maybe because I was so dedicated to my boxing that uh, I had no downtime, you know, after school or at the weekend. Like that was when I sort of went into more of a focused uh, state of mind. Uh, maybe I messed about at school a little bit too much because I felt like that. That was where I needed to um, have a bit of a release, you know, of the pressure of um, you know boxing. Did you start? Did you start believing in yourself at a very young age? With fuck school, I'm going to be a boxer. I'm going to be world champion. Like, did you believe that? At early age, or was it just something you messed around with until you started realizing that you were decent at boxing? Yeah, no. I mean, it was always boxing. Always going to be boxing. Believed in myself from from the get go. I thought I was going to be the greatest of all time. You know, um, there was no no ceiling to sort of my ambition. Um, and that's and I think my parents were were fine with that. They you know they wasn't pushy academically and they were a little bit pushy at the start in terms of your boxing but once they knew that, you know that was what I wanted to be they, they even left me to my own devices in in that respect as well so you know I, I never missed the gym I was just that that type of guy that that type of kid training I I never ever missed a session I was always the first one in last one out you know when you start boxing for England at 15 16 I'd, I'd be at every squad you know that was whoever it'd be Crystal Palace uh, for the weekend or if it was up in South Shields or Manchester, wherever I, you know, I, I made sure I moved heaven and earth to be there. Um, just all all in for boxing. So knew I could make a career out of it, providing, you know, uh, I want to. And nothing really crept into your mind in terms of, am I good enough? I'm going to make it. Am I going to get injured? It, it, it was nothing, none of that. So it was always just, yeah, boxing through and through. How many amateur fights did you have? I had 75 amateur fights in the end. Um, but I was quite a big kid, so I never had a lot of, like, comp uh, what are they called, like, club shows, you know. So out of those 75, um, 73 of them were either internationals or championships. So I'd go in um, to the schoolboys, as I said, then it would be to go through the, the years, junior ABAs, senior ABAs, and then if not, I'd be boxing for England. So... Um, yeah, it was great. I mean, I got to travel the world. I went to places that I otherwise would have probably never have been to. I went to countries that, 
you know, before people went to them countries, you know, I was in Baku in Azerbaijan in 2004, you know, I'll be in Bosnia, um, in, I can't remember where we were in Bosnia in 2005, like, uh, Macedonia, these countries that, you know, uh, it's great for me now. It's the conversation piece. So you meet parents in the, in the queue and I'm dropping, I'm at the school drop off. And then there might be a, an international kid who's come over and his parents from Azerbaijan. I say, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> like, and uh, it goes a long way. They yeah. like it. And then, I, I mean, I'd never have much of a story to tell. I'm like, yeah, we got there. It was cool. We stayed in our room. We boxed. We went home. But uh, I've been there. <laughs> Any decent fighters did you come up against in your amateur career that kicked on? Yeah, no one, no one. I don't think that I've boxed, but um, some some name drops that we, you know, we were in and amongst my sort of um, age group. Uh, we went to uh, Morocco one year for the World Championships, and uh, Vasil Lomachenko was there, won a gold. Uh, <laughs> it was just, you know, he boxed. Uh, he was an incredible boxer. Um, Ukrainian, obviously, um, boxed. Uh, the prelims, the quarters and semis, orthodox, and then box the final southpaw <laughs> and beat the Cuban, stop the Cuban on this. Like back then, you used to have a twenty point rule, so if you got twenty points ahead, they'd just stop the stop the bout. Um, Tyson Fury was on that trip. Um, Ashley Sexton, Jamie Cox, a few others. It was it was a good trip. I think I think all them guys were there. It was a good trip. How was Big Tyson as a kid? Yeah, well, he sort of he came. I mean, he he came a little bit later than me. So um, I don't know if he started boxing later, but I, there was like, I remember one of the officials. So you'd, you'd have an English judge that would come with you. An English, they, I don't know what they, they just call him. It was like, he would take care of the team, like a team manager, and then a couple of coaches. And one of these referees of official was from Manchester. And he was talking about this guy, Tyson. And I thought it was a black guy. Because right? he's saying he's, he's huge, he's ripped, his muscles there. And then when he came through the door, I was like, Oh, it's the, he's he's very big, but he's not at all what I thought he was going to be. Um, and he was um, nice guy. Like I mean, you said, we still was a nice guy, but like nowhere near what he is now. Like um, he was a little bit shy and timid, I'd say. Yeah, if I, if I'm if I'm honest, where he was there, I'm sure he would agree. Um, you know, he would he'd do his do his training, and he was just. For seventeen, he was about the same size he is now when he was seventeen. So he'd come out and he'd be fighting these guys that are just down here. Um, he got, I think, he won a bronze medal at that. that so a bronze medal at the World Championships or under nineteen uh, is a great achievement. So then I don't know. We was on squad a bit together, and then he, uh, yeah, we we actually both turned pro in and around the same time. We both didn't really fancy our chances for twenty twelve. Fancied a, a oh, why is pros. that? Well, you know, you're you're rolling the dice on. Um, do you not fancy the London Olympics? Not really, no. Uh, so my, my friends on squad were at the time were Luke Campbell and Anthony Agogo, who both went on to medal at the Olympics. Obviously, Luke went on to win it. Um, but Good we guy, were, Luke. Luke's a great guy. Great guy. Uh, our paths crossed again in the in the pros in that he, he ended up joining um, the McGuigan stable when I was I was training there. So always stayed in touch with 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 Luke and Anthony. Um, Anthony, a bit more unlucky, um, had some injuries that he accumulated and i think they were most likely through the wear and tear of the amateur boxing game where you're out every month boxing the best guys in the world you they they train you into the ground at times and you know it's it's a, it's a numbers game for them you know it's great it's great win the medal but you are just like a number for the funding if yeah. you've got the gold medal great we go again it, but they don't care who wins that gold medal as long as someone wins a gold medal um and i just had dreams and ambitions and aspirations to be a world champion pro that's what i wanted to be um i wanted to go to beijing 2008 um i, I digal got picked and digal qualified and james Digal won a gold medal so the joke that i like to say is well i couldn't exactly say you sent the wrong guy you know um and it would have been lovely to have to have um gone and competed represent my country and hopefully have won something but um for me it just wasn't worth risking four years of my career to try and go and emulate what De Gaulle had done when really in four years time um I could be fighting for a world title so is that what kind of yours 
beef started the way back 2008 with that was there nothing towards him against him going instead of you no it started a bit before then so we box as amateurs we're both from the same amateur club um bizarrely uh both from from the dale youth in west london um Degal was a little bit older than me so he had gone in the senior abas twice and won it twice which was a fantastic feat you know from 18 and then 19 went to the commonwealth games and won a bronze medal um, but then I'm I'm 18 now. I want to go in the senior ABAs. We're the same weight. You, know, you have to fight, and then um, and I beat him. So uh, that's I'd say that's where the rivalry might have started a little bit before then. But then it definitely well, we we did, we weren't friends since. We haven't really spoke since. So what age did you turn pro? 20. So it's very young. It's a young age I for pro. Like, what was it like your first pro fight? Did you realise okay this is what I want? Was it a big step up from amateur? than it was pro yeah I think well, so I, t I turned professional with um, the Haymaker sort of promotional banner which Adam Booth was Adam Booth the, was a trainer manager promoter <laughs> he wore every night yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it? he was there and then um, and I wanted to train with Adam um, I'd sort of I'd seen Adam in, a, in the gym a little bit I'd done a couple of sessions with him before turning pro um Try to you know you you go go around the gyms and talk to the the promoters or the the managers or the the trainers who represent sort of certain stables and uh, but I like them guys I I just you know I felt like I was already an underdog because I was up against James Degau who was the Olympic champion so I had to carve out my own route um, not get left behind and at the time David Hay was doing the exact same thing you know he was sort of anti Warren who Frank Warren was the, the big promoter at the time he had Enzo Macronelli um he had the deal with with Sky and you know he was he was he had Khan he had he's he'd, had, he'd been the number one guy for a long time so I thought I can't sign with Warren because I'll be behind De Gale um and then you know but even even if he was interested I think I still would have gone with 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 Haymaker because um I just really really liked um, the way they work, you know, they're, they're set up. And um, we went into, uh, I think I probably turned professional, you know, the early half of 2008. Didn't have a debut until November 2008. So I'd been in the gym with them for four or five, maybe even six months. Been out to Cyprus with them. That's where they were living at the time. And uh, it was the best time. I mean, it was just amazing. You know, you're just like, you feel like you're now you're living the life because... You're out in Cyprus, you're staying in a lovely villa, you know, um, the sun's out, you're in a great gym, you're next to a world champion, you're doing all this sort of specific, interesting, you know, type training stuff that you haven't really been exposed to yet before. So, um, no, like life was good. And, and there and then you're like, wow, this is this is a dream. That was that. What was it like, your first pro fight? Did you, were you nervous? No, not really. So I was, it was at the O2, it was on a hay... Monty Barrett undercard. I got the tube there, which <laughs> yeah, the glamour of Classy it. Classy um, stable. And I don't know what was wrong with the tubes that day, but I almost didn't make it. Like so, um, I don't know. Maybe I was just a bit too lax. Let left it a bit too. And I went there on my own. Like this, I'm quite content in my own company. So I had my little, I had my big old bag. You know, all my new kit in there, my new silk shorts, my boots, everything. Um, and yeah, Adam, the trainer, was stressing out apparently, saying if he ain't here in 15 minutes, he goes on last. And then if you go on last, that means everyone's gone home. No one's going to, yeah. they're not going to film you. It's been nothing. But I made it there on time, boxed a, a chap called Kirill Pashonko. Uh, Where's he from? <laughs> Lithuanian guy, lovely guy. Uh, I think he was like 2 and 0 at the time, or he may not even have had a winning record. Um, tough guy. I wanted to get rid of him, as you do. Like yeah, back then, you think, oh, I want to be unbeaten with, with a, 100% KO record but we didn't we went in the full six rounds couldn't get rid of him um, loaded up on my shots a bit too much and Is that uh, nerves? maybe maybe or maybe nerves and excitement and just just being overzealous but it's, it's it was I think it was a good a good opening for me you know like the cliche things that I want rounds but what I learned from it was just that like it's not always about effort you know you have to you know, vary vary the attacks vary the power take your time set stuff up um, and then it will come, you know, rather than just plowing on. And sometimes you see young pros, they might be in their 10th fight and they've still got that mentality of this just effort, effort, effort. It's like, no, you can take the time. You can relax, pick your shots, set it up, 
and wait for it. Because you obviously got off to a fly. I think you were 19 and 0, weren't you? You were flying and making waves. When was it the European title you won first? Was it not before the British? I won the Commonwealth. Commonwealth. Commonwealth in my ninth fight. So we tried to. Yeah, just try to try to crack crack on. Chief support for for a haymaker, David Hay uh, pay per view event, which was uh, he boxed John Ruiz. I think he just won the belt. He'd just beaten Valuev, you know, David versus Goliath uh, in Nuremberg, and I'd box on the undercard there. That was a weird fight, that. Is that that big fucking seven foot? Yeah, seven foot two, which I think he was a genuine seven foot two giant. Like, just one of the biggest Mm -hmm. people I've ever met. Yeah. Um, Apparently, he's quite sweet. Lovely guy. He didn't say much fight week, um, and he speaks not very good English, mainly Russian, but I think he's quite a soft guy. Likes his poetry. Likes his, you know, just happy to be there. It's mad that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but they, they, I mean, they rock the world, and you know, it was that was a fantastic time for me still because I'm, I'm in the machine. Like, I, it's not me, but I'm, I'm a standby, watching, trying to absorb, learn, um, see what you know, what is it, what, what, what does it take to be at the top end of, of boxing? Because at this point, um, even like the UK boxing market is, is, is coming into its own. Um, you know that. There's a real emphasis from Sky on selling pay-per-views on this big in, you know, a place where it's not just the stakes where you can go and earn life-changing money. Maybe now in the UK, it's going to overtake Germany and other countries like that. So um, to see David Hay at work in terms of drumming up um, interest in a fight was was amazing. To see the pressure that was under him um, in regards of the, the obligations in, in selling it um having a camera in front of him all the time and the little tricks where you know you could um create interest uh so i'd always try and note you know subconsciously little things that i thought ah, that was quite interesting that's not that's not quite my style but i would have gone about that in slightly different way but i get i get the the end result um and then from there, yeah, you're just excited by by his progression. I want to push on. So, um, you know, nine fights in fighting for championship level. I'm already doing full camps, 12, 12 rounds. Um, beat a guy called Charles Adamu. It doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> 40 year old um, Gar- Garnayan, maybe, or something. I don't know where he's from. Somewhere in the Commonwealth. We got him over, beat him, stopped him. Um, and we're up to we're up to championship level, and and I gotta admit I was um, competing with James Agout at the time, like not not directly but indirectly. You know, I wanted to get to championship level before him um, because I felt like you know he's gonna the opportunities are gonna go his way if I don't grab them before him because he's got the name because he's got the gold medal behind him because he's got Frank Warren and Sky and everyone else behind him. You know, I signed with David Hay who was fighting on Satanta, which was a brand new. Sh- um, channel no one was subscribing to it and eventually it probably folded within a year of us being there so it was almost in no man's land there where i've got a box you know on other people's shows try and get a little bit of exposure i'm not getting the tv slots because i haven't got an olympic medal uh i had to get to championship level to you know just get the mm-hmm. tv airtime did the gale keep you focused i think i think yeah i think i think i would have been anyway but definitely he was someone for me to focus on um, he was a rival, you know. Uh, great I, fighter. I, I love a good rival. Yeah, you know? he's great and he's fighter. a very good fighter, James Agal. Very, very good fighter. Um, yeah, you're saying that you would never, I would never admit, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> while we're while we're competing, because uh, it was always just, it always seemed better for me to put him down. Um, but of course, a very, very good fighter, talent mm-hmm. fighter. We've done hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of sparring rounds together through the course of our amateur careers. Um, so. We knew each other you know, as well as could possibly mm-hmm. know each other. It's just whether, and we'd even box with boxers and amateur. And uh, our paths, it felt, were destined to cross. Um, Did you always believe that right at the start that something big was going to happen with that? I think so. I think so. I think. I mean, there was a few people um, who had been around boxing would say like, you know, this is huge. You know, like to me, it's just like whatever. You know, like this. Surely this comes around all the time but it doesn't you know two two guys from the same gym doing well good fighters who can potentially go on to win world titles um from exactly the same place who grew up together it's, it's bizarre so um it's bizarre that you'd be on friends then yeah yeah i mean i mean i'd say before just we, because there was pure competition between i think us before be it best? became 
competition. I'd say we, we were more than amical with each, with each other. Like we would we would you know get on. You go on trips together. We went to Vegas one year together and stuff like that. Uh, but we never like shared a room or really got that 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 close. But there was times where. We'd have a squad training in Crystal Palace and I'd jump jump a lift with him in the car and we'd, we'd cruise over there. And um, So there was times where, where I suppose we, we would get on. But yeah, and I quite like it that by the time we became rivals, um, we could just be at each other's throats, you know. We could, we could, get, get what what it's all about. It's what it's all about. This is, um, it feels like life and death at the time and, and, and it is, you know, it's, it's, who, who wants it most you know it's five of the fittest uh, so ugh, I'm not here to make friends how did you how did you feel after winning the Commonwealth were you buzzing or were you thinking it's not enough yeah I mean both really like chuffed and happy with the performance um, I remember Adam Booth being really happy with the performance and at that stage in my career I think um, I was um, really respect, uh, re receptive to his um you know his comments and uh, his praise. You know, I wanted to to impress him. Um, I wanted to, you know to wanted his reassurance. I felt like he 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 was a, a guy who who knew about pro boxing. So if he says this is good, then then I'll, I'll go with it. Um, and I felt like I'd got the jump on on Digale. Like so, at this point, the British title was probably being contested by Paul Smith and. Um, I think he boxed Tony Dodson and there was like, it was around, there was a Liverpool click for a while. There was Tony Quigley and Dodson, a few others. So I was like, I want to get to that British title before De Gale gets there. Uh, I didn't because um, Paul Smith was signed to Warren and, you know, they just made, that was an easy fight for them to make. So De Gale got there first, but I feel like the Commonwealth was very important just in terms of um, putting my, you know, my name out there uh, and setting up what will soon become you know, a huge, uh, a huge domestic dust up between me and the girl. Yeah, the British title comes across like you say, you're fighting the girl, but you were a massive underdog, massive underdog. Like nobody really gave you a chance to win. Like, how was that then from two stable mates to then becoming rivals to then? Because even when you watch, like, I can remember it from years ago because I feel even with the rivalries, you always seem calmer. I don't know if that's because that irritated people more because you never seem to got agitated you seem to have got under people's skin like did you know how to push the girls buttons with being just not in his face i think um i think that 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 part of of fighting that part of competing of, of battle or whatever you want to go into like uh is important so um you know every every aspect of the the bout we're about to take place is a fight you know not just once that first bell goes it's before the fight when the fight's made you know every time a camera comes out i wanted to portray myself a particular way and you sort of have to think on your feet and go with it and you start off calm you start off calm because you're in control you know you're calm in the chaos you know you're just you're there uh present in the moment and roll with the punches as cliche as that is and and that was kind of my approach with the gale my first time really on the big stage um, where essentially we ended up plugging and selling a pay-per-view, you know, as, as a main event. So, you know, I wanted to behave uh, and come across a particular way. I wanted to convince people that I'm not an underdog. You know, I shouldn't be an underdog. And even if I am, trust me, I don't believe that for one second. Um, I am cool, calm, composed, I know this guy, I know what it takes to beat him um, and we will, we'll do it and we, we do it properly. So, um, yeah, I think I think that that might have agitated him a bit. I think he was probably a bit nervous with the confrontations that we have to do pre-fight. Uh, he was, he'd be much more content if we just had yeah, to just fight, you know. Uh, but my, my game plan was just to come in, listen to what he got to say, anticipate what he's going to say, I should be honest beforehand um, and have a, a quick and sharp and composed and calm answer uh, straight away you know uh, and um, I mean it worked it was great for telly uh, you know the Sky used to do an episode of Ringside that went out weekly and is still there 
their their biggest ever episode where I think it got the most views, most most <laughs> most clicks. Uh, people still talk about it now. So um, oh, because you had the suit and that on. Yeah, but that's the thing, you know. I mean, I'm pe- I'm peacocking, you know. I have got to be honest, I'm peacocking. I'm trying to make make a scene, make a show of myself, and you know, I'll, I'll come in a suit with a with a with a Larry tie because. I'm young and brash and this is what this is me you know this is how i this is this is me um knowing full well that it would be a stark contrast to what james was going to wear because oh, i just assumed he would come in tracksuit you know and it doesn't matter how designer the tracksuit is you know you're sitting on a stall with your t-shirt half undone it looks a bit to me it would look a bit um you know uh unprofessional, unprofessional. Mm. so I, i'll come suited and booted you know we're here any excuse for me to put a shirt on you know i wear i wear a, a tracksuit to work every day when i go to the gym so if i can put a shirt on great for me uh if he can sit down it, the tie the tie is there if he's going to mention the tie i take that as a win and it's not the first time i've said it but um he doesn't know this is my my mindset but i'm like if he mentions my tie i've won like i've won i've won the <laughs> argument i've won the debate because he because we're here to talk about boxing and he can't compete with me talking about boxing he's going to talk about the tie so um yeah i mean i i remember coming out of that uh being like i'm happy with that i think that was really good i think that came across really well but my you know my part i think people will buy into that whether they buy into me or not i'm not sure but i think i done well there. And then when I watched it back, I was like, yeah, that was good. Yeah. <laughs> I was happy with that. Because that's you hitting the big stage then. Was that your plan to come clean cut, like well presented, new kid on the block, still undefeated, like British title, massive fight. Like, was that your plan to go in with that kind of style and reputation? I think so. I mean, I, I mean I'd wanted to be, uh, come across, um, I mean, I'm not smart. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not educated as such. I finished school, um, but I didn't want to come across as, you know, uh, thick, like, you know, like, lot, like, I mean, that was the cliche for boxing. It felt like at that time there was a lot of boxers out there that were either just rough and ready and cheeky chappy and, you know, real working class. And every story is about, you know, boxing saved my life. If, if, if it wasn't boxing, I'd be out <laughs> shooting and drinking and killing and this and that. And I was thinking, I don't know if I, I don't know if that would have been me if I wasn't boxing, you know, um, but so yeah, I thought wow, I'm trying to do something a bit different. Always do something a bit different because um, a bit different is interesting for me. You know, like if I see someone in a particular field and they're doing something a little bit different, then like, I'm much more likely to gravitate towards that. Um, be conscious that that not just the way I dress and the way I look, but also the things I say might help pick up traction, you know, in the press and keep journalists happy and stuff like that, which. You know, they've told me since, you know, it did, you know, I was always, I was one of half a dozen who could get in the, get in the national papers when that stuff sort of mattered before we would do stuff like this, where this is now the medium that people, you know, um, eat up. But, uh, yeah, so I think that it was important. It was really important. Um, and it helped with your boxing because it helped because there was, there was an element of, game plan involved in that it's like i'm gonna if i can anticipate what he's gonna do what he's gonna do and say now it makes it much easier to anticipate what he's gonna do in the ring yeah. you know, in 12 weeks time how did you handle the underdog status like because you genuinely believed that you were going to win like how did you handle that and was that an extra boost that an extra boost of confidence to then go i need to prove all these people wrong or did it like, make you angrier? Like, how does that yeah. work? Like, how did everybody works differently with that sort of things? But if you're underdog to a rival, like, how did it make you feel? I think the first, the first, the first time I was an underdog, so many times underdog, but first time with the Gale uh, was the first time I had to really deal with, deal with it, and that was that was tough. I think it was really tough. I had to be um, resolute in you know unwavering self belief. It's something I talk about now, and that is where I sort of first that first came in you know where you you live and breathe it um and you have to experience it you know with everyone and then sometimes there'll be people out there who you believe will see things your way and then they don't and then you're like well really so uh, you want me to win but i got a feeling you don't think i can win um and i probably spent a, a bit of energy a bit too much energy the first time around with Digel trying to convince people of the fact I'm gonna I'm gonna beat him. You know, this is not a step too far for me. The three to one underdog, you know, odds that I've got is just bizarre. 
or whatever it was. So yeah, I'd say I say it was I say it was tough. It, I wouldn't necessarily say it was it was a motivation to um, to prove these people wrong. It didn't feel like that at the time. I mean, the motivation was already there just to, just to be to be James, like because we're from the same place, you know. Um, and that time it was people actually lots of people wanted me to win, but they just didn't think I could. Which is like not exactly. <laughs> By the time I crack on with I'm fighting Frotch, people now think I, I'm not going to win, and they don't want me to win. So that was a bit of a change up. But in terms of the, the first time with the uh, yeah being being an underdog, um, it's just James. James, it's just unwavering self belief. Like it. Where do you get that from? Yeah, that's the thing. Where do you get that from? It's just. I mean, you get it from you. You'll gain confidence um, from putting the work in being prepared in every way not just hitting your targets in the gym but getting yourself mentally prepared for the for the, the the challenge or the task at hand whatever's coming your way um sometimes that is more important than the physical side sometimes you can tick all the physical boxes but if you mentally are not there then you'll um you just, you pretty much won't make it whereas if you're mentally there but you might not quite tick all the physical boxes as long as you believe it i think you've got a much better chance of of achieving it um you know I, i'm not exactly sure uh, <laughs> where that came from the first got to dig deep about something but adam booth's tactics didn't like them because he was just wanting you to just chip off rounds like he wasn't wanting you to go full steam ahead or come straight out like he was just wanting you to nick rounds but you weren't happy with that why well i think i i mean i went with it like don't get me wrong like it wasn't like i was arguing with him every week i don't want to do this i went with it i mean and you know, you, that's just, it. Just wasn't my style of fighting. So straight away, I'm gonna to have to do something brand new. And if you're asking me to pick around, nick around, then there's a risk element to that, of course. That you know, if if they're if they're watching it through Digel goggles, which they very well might be, because he's an Olympic champion, he's the the A side of the fight, and you know, he's the one who's destined to apparently go on and, and do great things. Then these rounds might not quite go my way. Um, but I think, um, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't change the result in any way. I wouldn't roll a dice on, I'd roll a dice on any other, um, decision. I get, I get the idea behind the tactics. Cause I mean, the gal was a, uh, a very good, uh, pro fighter already where he, you know, he sit, he can sit in the pocket at times and, and fight well, you know, um, he could stay in his legs. He can punch loose and fast, um, from the hips and to be honest at where I was in in my career I hadn't quite really developed that 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 side of my boxing yet you know I was still a real good fast sharp shooter um like to keep stuff at real long range um, um wait on the back leg and, and spring off and let him have it and that's kind of what I've been developing with Adam Booth for the past two two and a half years uh a David Hay-esque type s style because ultimately that's kind of what happens a lot lots of trainers say oh every fight is different and we do everything very differently but ultimately um there you can't help but pick up things from the guys around you especially the guys who may be in front of you or you've been in bigger fights or whatnot so you know i'm working alongside david hay now i've got a low left hand now i've got the right hand dressed i'm trying to do the shoulder roll i'm bouncing i'm, I'm circling around the ring um so this was the right tactics for for Digel. I, th I think it was the right tactics for Digel. I mean, if we had boxed near the end of our careers, then it would have been a totally different fight, and I would have fought differently. But by then, I'd worked with two other coaches. I'd been involved in however many other fights. So, but right then, um, yeah, it was it was tough. It was hard because you had to be on it. You know, I had to be on it. I had sparring partners in and Southpaw sparring partners, which were hard to find at times, and we had to get them in and out um, because. Uh, I was sparring at a frantic pace because you know it was it was it was calm in that you know your mind's nice and calm, but we was doing this in and out movement, in and out movement, circling, you know, pot shot in two uh, ones and two shots, break out again, create distance, create distance, because um, we didn't want to get um, didn't want to just sit in range with Degal, who would then just he could just let his hands go, finish the exchange well, and then ultimately just nick rounds himself that way. So. Um, how was it when the round the, the final bell went both of you lifted your hands like tough 12 rounds like both of you thought you'd win like did you know or did you think fuck this is close yeah I mean I was 
you got to be honest with yourself and sometimes you watch it back and you 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 might get a confused memory but I, I genuinely believe that i was confident that i'd won the fight because um we would sort of not i wasn't tallying up the rounds when i was sitting down but there wasn't many rounds where i thought i've lost that round it was rounds i was sitting down it's like i've won that round i've won that round i've won that round so i was convinced that i'd won the won the fight and in my mind at the time i thought i'd won it more convincingly than the scorecards or then you know retrospectively watching it back um also wanted to also know at this stage that in case in case that last round is the is the deciding round and my hand shoots up um i've won this fight just to give the judges and the general consensus that of everyone watching at home that this is my fight i've won this and i think um people were just surprised that i was in the fight let alone winning the fight um, because people thought it, it, you know Diego was just gonna walk through me um so yeah i think once you know jimmy lennon jr is reading out the scorecards it's uh it's dramatic you know it's a you realize it's going to be a, a split decision or a majority decision but once i realize there's a winner i've got my hand up already and it's just like oh yeah this is nice <laughs> this is one good. point two yeah probably point, probably yeah probably two scorecards one point that close straight majority, majority split see that win there like, how, how does that then enhance your career because if you'd lost how do you think you would have handled that like rivalry two undefeated fighters to be the best in Britain at your weight like how do you think that then that would have do you think that would have affected you and set you back or do you think it would have pushed you on if you did lose that fight oh, I would have been a massive setback at that point a massive massive setback I, I mean I wouldn't really know how to um quantum like the effects for that would be would it be me then doubting uh my team like doubting adam booth doubting the setup um doubting myself in that i've gone along with this idea of fighting was that right was that wrong um anxiety about where i go next because um you know if as i say i'm still i'm still the fighter trying to emerge trying to build a name so you get b at this stage you get you're right to the back of the queue um and it might take you know a couple of years to sort of come again um i had no major promoter behind me um it would have been it would have been you know terrible so uh it was uh that in itself means that it's just, it's career, like a career the importance of that win my career was huge so but you've got the commonwealth european british this at this point no it's just commonwealth and british uh -huh. so i end up fight i do fight for a world title before i win the commonwealth mm -hmm. um and at the time it felt like a long time between um winning the british and then fighting for a world title but really it's probably only about nine fights yeah nine fights to 90 but i think it's about two two and a half years so uh -huh. yeah it's fair, fair enough to, uh, yeah long enough time so you must have been on cloud nine then you've beat a rival both undefeated fighters like you're buzzing like did that give you so much confidence to then feel as if okay like everything i've set out to do is it's coming into existence like world titles you're going to be a world champion soon that like, you just everything felt normal yeah yeah i know we all this is great we're, 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 what what next what next you know i'm taking on the world as i say at this at this point james i, I think i'm the greatest fighter of all time i mean don't get me wrong catch me catch me now after a couple of beers i'll still tell you the same thing <laughs> but um yeah at this point it's just like uh you know, I never got really hung up on legacy or anything like that, but it's just like, what you know, what's in here? What do I believe? And like, I'm wavering self belief. I'm like, well, give me, give, bring on the big guys. Who who we got next? You know, um, Frotch Frotch was world champion at the time, and I'm covering covering his fights. You know, for uh, BBC on the radio and stuff like that. And I'm, I feel like I'm ready to fight this guy already. We um, we managed to get a, a world title challenge. I was signed now signed with Frank Warren um he'd sort of just set up box nation which so broke away from sky he's got box nation which is a new tv subscription channel and it's struggling really to be honest it's not he it was struggling it, you know it wasn't getting it's not like i've got so i've gone from sky pay-per-view with the gale to subscription only channel but he warren's doing his bit he's getting me fights keep me busy and he managed to get me a, a world title challenge uh in germany against uh, a chap called robert stieglitz for the wbo i think it was um so i was out in cyprus on a training camp preparing for that so it, the dream was rocking on like i'm pushing on for, for a world title i'm gonna break all the boundaries i'm gonna be the greatest of all time i get i get injured in the build-up for that fight and it gets um 
he ends up getting pulled or we tried to postpone it but um at this stage i'm not the biggest draw where they postpone a fight it's like okay you're out <laughs> someone else is in but to be honest that was a, that was a blessing because mm -hmm. uh i ended up fighting frotch you know for, in a mega fight not that long after so but yeah we're we're, we're, we're in we're right in the on mix. course mm. so you're 19 and 0 and again carol frox again but your rivalries seem it's pure hatred like again is that down to you or is it just is it created through like even frotch like you both kind you fucking hated each other like i think frotch hates everybody to be fair but you kind of was that genuine and it grows into something to sell fights and you genuinely do hate each other by the end or like obviously to promote a fight we've got you've got to cause chaos to put asses on seats and people to buy tickets but how did that rivalry start because by the looks of it you both did hate each other as well yeah i think i mean i think frotch can be honest with it and i know this is honestly for me i didn't hate him at the start i just just didn't i mean I know nothing Tim that was that was the mindset of me is like I don't like you dislike you I just nothing you you're not important to me um <laughs> I, I felt like, and it sounds horrible but that's the way I would encourage any fighter to sort of be before a fight you know don't get emotionally attached get emotionally detached um I have no emotional feeling towards you in the slightest um and he was going on his own journey um it had been in big fights for a long time and not quite sort of landed as a big British boxing name. Um, but coming back and beating, after coming out of the Super Series, beating Lucien Butte, you know, in his home, uh, in his hometown, uh, great win against an unbeaten fighter. He was an underdog in that fight on free to air on Sky, although, you know, a subscription Sky, but so he, he's like, his career is now taking off. Um, and in the meantime, sort of, I'm just, meandering around so he probably has got one eye on me knowing that you know i'm coming for him at some point and i'm not being nice about him like it's just not in my nature i think we're gonna fight then i'm you know the art of war kicks in early doors um i went out to he was boxing Mikel kessler um at the o2 in the unification fight and i went to copenhagen to spar kessler for that fight who was kessler uh, we only did a few rounds, to be honest. I never got a lot out of him, but um, it was my fault. I sort of sparred and, and flew home. Um, and he was, yeah, he's good. Nice guy, Kesler. Like, lovely guy. Uh, Remember him and Joe Kozagi fight? Like, fucking unbelievable, man. Yeah. I, know, I mean, he must have been quite, or not, maybe not young, but he was definitely early on in his career. That was a long time ago. Um, but a great, great fighter. You know, uh, an exception in terms of being a Danish fighter because... And they don't produce a lot of world champions, but yeah. it's a special fire. Um so that upset that upset Carl. I boxed chief support on that card. So um That was Carl's first loss, wasn't it? Was no, it? this was so this was the rematch when he beat him in the rematch. Beat him in the rematch. Uh yeah, so now he's unified and it was the fight before for me. He had the IBF belt. Um and then Eddie Hearn came to I was still with Adam Booth, so Eddie Hearn came to the Haymaker gym in Vauxhall. Um they went through the IBF uh, rankings and like uh, number one was vacant, number two was vacant, uh, number three was fighting, number four, number five didn't want the fight. I was number six, do I want to fight Frotch on a mandatory? I was like, yeah, I like that. Yeah, that's cool. And I, I don't know if they thought I'd be up for it or not or whether, you know, boxers always told, oh, you're not ready yet. You need a bit more time. I was like, I'm ready. Like, I've been ready for years. Let's go. Um, so we had, we had, uh, yeah, I mean, I left Adam, Adam was my manager. I left him to it in terms of uh, sorting out the fight with with uh, Eddie Hearn, and then yeah, fight, fight was it wasn't a hard fight to make. We agreed to splits, and and away we go. The biggest fight of your career, though, that like world title shot, everything you've dreamed of as a kid, the guy you've worked with your whole pro career, nineteen and all that, he's done you massive favors. I don't know, obviously, the fucking politics with the shit, but how hard was that decision to then split ways with Adam Booth in the biggest fight of your life? Yeah, I mean, Adam, Adam, had, like we'd had uh, a, f you know, a f fractious, that's the word, relationship at times. You know, we'd, you know, we'd had problems like everyone because you're working like in a, in an intimate setting, you know, like you sort of, and there was times where he, as I say, he's my trainer, manager, he's been my promoter. Um, he was someone who I looked up to at the start of my career and I thought he knew so much about boxing and then there's times where I'm like, well, he's only human, he doesn't know everything and um, 
at this point, um, I just needed a lot more commitment. It was it was it was maybe an awkward stage where, sort of, I felt like I was taken over from David Hay. So David Hay was the the big boy, the golden goose, the pay per view star, the guy who's world champion, and sort of we all have to work around him a little bit. Um, I think Adam had had problems with 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 Hay in that respect. Probably wanted to have a different setup with the next guy who's coming along, the, the, the next David Ayers, which is me. I wasn't exactly sure how that was going to pan out between us. Um, but I was like, right, mate, this is this is it. This is me. This is my time. It's what I've been working for my entire life. Um, I'm the man. I'm the main man. I've always been the fucking main man, James. I'm coming now. It's my turn. <laughs> Jump in. Let's go. Um, and yeah, so it, you know, he... Uh, we had a little. We had a, we had an argument about um, just before the first first press conference to announce the fight with Froch, and um, I hadn't told him about it and told anyone about it. But in my mind, I sort of I felt like I was um, making a real effort with him at the time. Like I felt like I was making more effort than than I needed to for the trainer, especially the trainer looking after the fighter. But I was like pandering to him a little bit um and you know uh he didn't want to come he, he sort of threw his dummy out the out the pram and he didn't want to come to the first press conference because he i think it was that he wanted to he, he wasn't sure if he had to be in london for a sparring session for david hay because he was maybe fighting fury at the time um David Hay doesn't start his sparring sessions before 8 p.m. You know, uh, I've seen Adam Booth take sparring sessions over Zoom for for David Hay. So I was like, that wasn't a sorry, that wasn't a comfortable enough excuse for me to not to miss the first press conference for my you know my world title fight. Personally, I felt like he was maybe just trying to hold me to ransom or just want maybe he just wanted me to say please. And uh, at that stage, it was just like, nah, uh, it's cool. I'll go. Um, I'll sort it out. Um, and I just had it in my mind that if we don't, if he doesn't come with me to the press conference, then that's great because then that's a clean break. I have got everything sorted. Like I don't actually need anyone at this stage. All I've got to do is fight. The fight is made. All I've got to do is sharpen and fight. And that, worse comes to worse, I can do this on my own. You know, I have that much self belief. I can I can prepare myself for a world title on my own. I've done it. I've done enough camps now. I know the training. I know this. I'll miss out on some pad work, which will be. Um, a bit shit but i can book some sparring i can find a gym i can do all these things um you're actually expendable at this point uh if you're not that's going to do your job so yeah i think maybe it was a bit a bit of chicken and bluff and then um yeah that was it sorry well, I can't but how the fuck does that make you feel do you know what i mean like you've put your whole life into this moment like and then you've got it in your mindset that you're going to train yourself and do that like that's sad and my is like somebody who's put it all in a line to then got his big chance and then you're thinking you're going to start training yourself or your biggest fight that like, because even when I, I i think it was when you were doing the face off i think Froch says to you as your coach yeah how so did he I'm, pick up on that well adam adam had messaged eddie Hearn, the promoter and said I'm no longer working with george so anything to do with this fight um go direct to um george Obviously, he's told Frotch straight away, like, because uh, Eddie's cool like that. Um, <laughs> and I was like, Ugh. I was disappointed again. I was disappointed with, with Adam that he'd done that. So I was like, so I've come up here without you. You don't really know what I'm going to say up here. So you've, you've maybe bottled it and thought I'll get in first and say I'm not working with George rather than me going up there and saying I'm not working with Adam. Uh, at the time, I was thinking, that's a result. I'm not paying him his 25% or whatever mm -hmm. he was due. But uh, I knew that was a fight that I didn't really fancy having you know, right now. But um, I was just like, okay, cool. Um, this is this is, this is is good. Like, um, when you're an underdog in these situations, um, I can't help myself but feel that I want to convince the guy in front of me that you got it all wrong, man. You are you got it all wrong and as i say carl was at a stage in his career where he had sort of he was getting a lot of positive you know feedback you know everyone loved him everyone was behind him everyone fought, bought into him and he bought into that so he did struggle for a while just with my demeanor my you know my confidence even i wouldn't give him any ounce of 
what he seems to respect, but me would just be just weakness. You know, I wouldn't be there to to praise him. Like, we're gonna have a fight. We're gonna we're gonna go out. And we're gonna share a ring. We're gonna swing at each other's chin. Like um, I'm not giving you anything. Um, so I think I think he he says that you know he, he struggled with that, but um, that was just how how it had to be. And then having not having a trainer, it was like. Whew, Watch, I don't need a trainer. I don't. I don't need anyone. It's just me and you. Um, How did you prepare for that fight then? So I, um, uh, a guy who I had done sort of ad hoc pad work with um, whilst training with Adam was a fellow called um, Paddy uh, Fitzpatrick. He ran an amateur gym in Swindon. Um, an Irish guy who had sort of travelled the world a bit, worked in the wild card gym and a few other gyms. Um, knew a lot of people. I'd always, I think, been like a second sort of in, and just maybe like a bit of a gym rat, you know. Um, but he knew a lot about boxing, and he was, um, he knew a lot about boxing, and and we'd done pads together. And I thought you're the right man for this job, you know. You you'll be interested in this job. Um, it's only ten weeks out now, so I'm not asking you to. I'm, even though I'm upheaving you at the moment um we can do this like so i went and had a meeting with paddy uh, i went down and met him at his gym he's got i don't know about now but he used to he used to live next door to his amateur gym like there was almost like one one big building um and he's a he's a cool quirky guy guys that remember him you know he's a he talks with a talks with a funny accent you know he wears a cool hat he's, he's got like a uh something hanging out of his mouth so something out of hockey fell in with yeah that. that's literally him that that was paddy so i said we do this uh, first like first of all uh i've got this fuck fight what do you think uh mm. so i'm i'm sort of um scoping him out at the time uh to make sure that he knows that i can beat frotch you know i don't want to hear we'll try you know um you got to be singing from the same hymn sheet as me uh when they put a camera in front of your face you tell them we're gonna we're gonna rip frotch's head off you know uh there's no long-term plan here this is purely short term this is world title 10 weeks let's go uh, he was on the same page as me. Um, brought it, he came came to London. Um, I gave my old coach Mick Delaney uh, a call. Said, "Can I come and use the gym?" So I was in the gym in the morning um, before the the juniors and the amateurs get in, sort of in the evening, so I could have the gym pretty much Monday to Friday every morning. Um, I brought a new uh, conditioning coach in, a fellow called Barry O'Connell, who's um, an ex Royal Marine. Um, really cool, interesting guy deep guy tough guy you know uh and i said to him look man i want to be teak tough i, I want to uh he was sergio Mar who was it at the time um martinez martinez who fought barker and i was like this guy looks like you know the fucking you just couldn't hurt him you know like he gets electrocuted or something and he just didn't, doesn't touch the bone like, you teach me how to be tough yeah so we did some tough work with barry i had dan lawrence who's working with loads of the um matchroom fighters at the moment he was my strength coach uh and did some conditioning so between the three of them we whipped ourselves into shape for um for manchester that's uh, mad like was there no big coaches trying to grab you from like Adam Booth, like, did nobody come forward and say, look, come under our stable? Or, I don't uh, think so. No, no. That's um, fucking mad. Uh, maybe I was a mess. Like Maybe people <laughs> were thinking, don't touch this guy, he could be toxic. Yeah. Um, or maybe they just thought it was just a bit of pillow talk and mm -hmm. I'm going to be back with, with Adam. But Adam was was uh, Adam and David and then me and Tam, we always were a bit, an element of mystique about you know the whole setup uh and keep people guessing and uh maybe they thought that that could have been it but um no for me i, I probably wouldn't have trained with anyone else if, it, if the paddy wasn't around i likely would have trained myself just because i would have missed out on all the pad work uh and i did a lot of like focus mitt pad work in my pro career i always sought out coaches that did that um because i think that's the best way to to improve um it's the closest thing to fighting apart from sparring. So um, I like, I like those guys. I like the, to think the, the feel and everything that comes with, with focus, mitt, pad work. So um, yeah, pad, paddy came down. We, we got ourselves in, in shape and, and away we went. So what you're thinking in that fight then, when you go into it, like, because your tactics is, Frotch is known as a fast starter himself. Like you came out flying. Like was that tactics from the start to change up? Yeah, well, I felt I felt like we wanted to start start quick, start start fast. Like 
that's pretty much me when I, you know, I didn't always do it, but that's, that's, that's the best way for me to, to start. Um, you know, I, especially at that point, I was pretty much a, pa a power fighter, a power athlete, like where, you know, I'd, I'd want to be uh, aggressive off the back foot um, and then just explode into range with, with big shots, you know, like a David Hay. Like that's what I'd sort of drilled for years, work with Adam Booth. And then it's sort of, that's sort of who the, the professional that I sort of come became. Um, what were you thinking then when you put Froch in his ass? And was it the first round? Yeah, first round. Yeah. Like, you <laughs> caught him clean, and I think he got up. Was it eight count? Like, like what yeah. were you thinking then? You're thinking, I've got him here. Yeah, I mean, you're thinking before the fight, you're like, you know, you're not visualizing knocking him down in the first round, but you're visualizing dominating him, you know, dominating the guy in front of you always. Everything's in your own control. I never used to visualize being under attack or being under the cosh or being behind on points or anything like that. It was always just visualize the very beginning of a fight. How are you going to come out? How are you going to shape up? Um, being fast and sharp, twitching, moving, countering, punching, uh, and then um, landing the big shots. Uh, so first round, um, Frotch makes a mistake. He gets overzealous. He uh, crosses his legs, walks into range, gets a big right hand over the top, and down he goes. Uh, and I just remember, it's just um, muscle memory. You're just like, Look, uh, there's, there's a great shot of me just looking at him the whole of the front row is jumping up this my, my side obviously they're all jumping up shouting and mine's just like no surprise let's go to neutral corner um, I'll get him and there was no like you're like don't build anxiety now about oh, this is nearly over this is my chance I'm, I'm going to get this is it, 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 you know because if he if he weathers the storm then you got to go again you know it's like you don't want to do that. You don't want to be like thinking the fight's over or feeling like the fight's over and then you've got to go again. That's exhausting. So it's like, man, I've dropped him in the first round. I've got 11 more rounds to finish him off. Great. No worries, right? End of the round. Great. Right, let's get him the next round. Get him the next round. And yeah, I mean, it, he doesn't really recover, um, in my opinion, from the first knockdown. I mean, he's just, he's got a great chin. He's got, you know, he's, he's got a fantastic chin. He's made like granite. He's, he's tough. He's a hard man. He's got the right mentality for um, just getting getting whipped anyway. So he's up off the floor. Um, he never really sharpens up after that because it's a heavy knockdown. And I end up probably punching him numb over the course of the next five rounds. So by the end of the sixth round, six rounds a heavy round. Like he lands, I land a lot of big right hands and a bit of inexperience from me working with a brand new coach. You know, you know biggest fight of my career and. You know, I'm a bit right hand happy, trying to finish him off. Um, and really, what I should have done was like maybe vary the power a bit. Definitely gone head and body, brought a bit more in from the left side, because you know that's you know them guys. They just they say they get numb to, to the right hand. Um, the fight takes a bit of a you know a bit of a slight dip of intensity, but I'm still winning the fight. And then obviously eighth round, in my opinion, like the referee jumps in and, and stops it for. A bizarre, a bizarre reason when sure I'm tired so is Carl I mean uh, my body's shape up might look maybe you know, I look a little bit more tired than the guy in front of me but I'm not the one who's been punched from pillar to post for the last eight rounds so yeah a, a bizarre decision from Howard Foster but uh that'd be the way be the way it goes. Foster should have never have stopped that. But do you think he just seen you maybe tiring and arms going down because you were still swinging? But the arms did go down a couple of times. But I think he's known for starting fights fast, is he not? Yeah, he's pretty well known for for jumping mm -hmm. in. I mean, it's like you you're then billed as a compassionate referee, which is a nice thing. You know, you don't leave guys in there to get to get taken out, but then you also run the risk of um, stopping a fight too soon. Yeah. And uh, sure, you know, like. Carl, Carl tells a, a, a great account when, when we do our little tours together uh, he, he tells the story a bit different from mine I want to get a big screen up the back you know <laughs> be like look man I'm still punching back you're still missing I'm still here I'm still there mm. you know uh, sure that the one left hand's already down you know I've got pale pasty skin mm. which turns red I can't breathe out my nose I haven't since like 2011 so my mouth opens when I get tired you know um I, you know, it doesn't do me any favors sometimes where I do look tired, but tiredness is not a reason to stop that fight. It's a world title fight, uh, which I should be miles ahead on the on the okay. scorecard. So tiredness is not that. There, there's an element of well, if I'd got off, say I got dropped heavy and I got up, and then 
he's hit me, like, battering me in the corner and the referee jumps in. You're like, well, oh, right, maybe he stopped me from getting KO'd, but it wasn't that. That wasn't yeah. the case. So it's just, I mean, it's one of them things. What can you do? Did you speak to Howard Foster after that? No, I've, I mean, I've never really spoke to Howard Foster about it. Uh, you're not allowed to speak to the British Boxing Border Control uh, officials in that regard. They don't do any statements or anything public. You usually get Robert Smith on, uh, who's the head of the board, who will just unequivocally back, you know, his his guys. And maybe that's the best way for them to to keep peace and order and, and get on with it. You know, there's been times where judges have got the, the scorecards wrong or, or fights have been stopped too early. So um, he's always going to stand by his... Uh, officials and and I think it is probably the right idea to not have them come out and make a statement immediately after um don't get me wrong I'd love a I'd love an apology in 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 private from him uh and it doesn't need to be a wholehearted you know it'd just be like sorry about that mate mm. uh, you know, <laughs> that, that'd, be, that'd be enough okay. but um but since then he's he's, ju he's judged my fights and he's even refed one of my fights since so you know I don't know he's not on my yeah. most wanted list or anything yeah because well I'm not a referee but you don't know the emotion the hype and what they see at that time to them for to them to make that decision that's mm -hmm. probably a decision you'll live with for the rest of your life like how do you deal with that 19 and 0 everything you've trained for confident that you're going to beat like it was a mega fight like to then beat Frotcha again like you can't take it away from like a world class fighter but how does that then fuck with your mind like to then Losing a world title shot, losing that, losing your undefeated record at a dodgy decision. Like, how was that probably the worst time in boxing for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was definitely at that point the worst time. But it was a little bit bizarre as well because you're sort of in this, um, you're aboard this train and it just keeps going, you know. So now I'm like, uh, I got a lot of lot of stuff going on. You know, I'm at war with Adam Booth. Um, trying to, you know, see out a, a management contract that, you know, uh, we're disputing. Uh, I feel like I've been robbed and fucked over by uh, Eddie Hearn, the promoter. I'm questioning his morals. What has he done? How has he had this involvement? Why has Howard Foster stopped this fight at this point? Like, um, has he believed the hype that, you know, I'll start fast but fade late and Frotch is a championship fighter and he'll get rid of me? Um was there any malice or corruption involved or is it, you know, is it just, is it just what it is? Um, I've got no, no manager now, uh, no promoter. Sky TV are, uh, are behind me in for their viewing, but they're not necessarily going to help me with my career. Um, because if I don't harness sort of the public hype around me right now, I'll soon just get, you know, forgotten about um which happens you know time and time again to fighters so i need to capitalize on this um capitalize on the the public um outcry really for 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 what felt like justice at the time and because of that it didn't really feel like a loss um we took ourselves to uh new jersey in new york to appeal with the ibf to get reinstated as a mandatory challenger which at the time was a big gamble. You know, I had other promoters telling me, sign with, sign with Golden Boy and we'll get you a WBC shot within two months. You know, sign with, um, you know, Sal and Brothers and you'll get a WBO shot within two months. You know, uh, sign with this one and we'll get you, re we'll create a WBA regular belt for you to fight for. You know, there was so many options, but each one meant I had to sort of give up give up something give up you know uh, to be tied into something that maybe doesn't pan out and it's me on my own making these decisions in real time i've got uh i've got a solicitor who relatively experienced but not in this sort of um field and then paddy who's been in and out the gyms but he's still brand new to me like i i um i want his opinion on it but i don't really want the pressure of him making those decisions as such so but we did we went we went to the ibf we got got reinstated as mandatory eddie Hearn telling me on the way out there on the flight out there you're wasting your money uh text him when we're done i said nope i said uh i'm mandatory challenger so let frotch know or he can post me the belt i'll have it you know <laughs> he's like oh well it, why, it's all good for the yeah. papers why was he not want you to go for the fight again uh i'm not sure i mean maybe he did maybe he didn't maybe he just wanted 
a little bit more control. Uh, at this point, I am wild. Do you know what I mean? I am going about my business in, and I'm unpredictable. I've learned from David Hay that uh, being unpredictable adds value. Uh, I'm I'm telling Eddie Hearn, listen, mate, I'm promoting this fight, <laughs> and don't forget, like this is Eddie Hearn trying to emerge. Like he's Eddie Hearn trying to. He's not. He's not the the the, the man he is today quite yet. You know, he's he's still in the making. So he wants to promote the fight. I said, no, I'm promoting the fight, Eddie. I'm doing site visits at Twickenham. Uh, I said, I've got a venue. I've got backing. I'm, I'm holding, I'm going to Monaco for meetings with you know, Russian billionaires. <laughs> uh, try and, try, I was like, and I'm, it's all just, it's all really just a hustle. And, you know, I would love Eddie Hearn to promote this fight. <laughs> I don't really want to do this job, but Extra I, need to, I need to create. Uh, Why were you doing that? Because you get, you feel as if you're getting fucked over with all these contracts and people working with you through your career. I think so. I think so. Well, <laughs> enough becomes enough, basically. At this at this stage, I need. I just want to take. I want to make my own decisions to, and um, be in charge of my own destiny as such. You know, and I didn't really have any trust or faith in anyone else to to do the job. You know, um, I'd felt I'd been let down by Adam, um, who was my trainer, manager, promoter, and I felt like. I felt like the underdog in every sense of the word. Uh, I just felt like there's no there's no one here for me, you know. Um, I've I've got I've got a, you know, and I've took the ball by the horns and l led from the front um, in the last ten weeks to to challenge Froch. Came really close, so this this I can do this. You know, I can do this. Do you think it would have been a different result if Adam Booth was there? Maybe. I mean, maybe. Uh, Maybe Adam would have had gave me slightly different instructions um, throughout the fight that might have made a difference. Um, but in truth, I'd sort of lost a lot of confidence and, and belief in him um, up at, at this stage. So even if he was telling me something, I'm not sure whether I would have believed it or not. Um, I, 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 I don't know. You know, you, don't, you, just, you just don't know. You'd say you'd say probably probably he could have given me a bit better instructions and then I could listened and um, got a, a slightly different result because I could have boxed better in that first Frosch fight uh, in terms of as I say just not being so right hand happy but um, also Adam wasn't the you know the the master trainer and sort of dark lord all knowing fucking person that I kind of thought he was for a little while. Um, you know, you realise that you talk to fighters, and you got you got to be out in it amongst it. You know, and by you know by me who I'm sitting here now, I've worked with half a dozen different coaches for amateurs and pros. You know, some intense periods, years on, some just in and out of gyms, just observing. I've been around world class fighters. All this stuff picks up. There's no right or wrong. There's no exact science. There's and then you have to figure it out for yourself. Adam kind of. I don't know how much how much time he'd spent working with other coaches, or even when he was with me working with other fighters. I'm sure he's a much better coach now through working with Andy Lee, Ryan Burnett, Mick Conlon, and Harlem Eubank, and whoever else he's with uh, than he was with me back in 2012. So, yeah, maybe. I mean, it's, it's a good it's a good point. So the second fight comes mega fight Wembley, eighty thousand people. Like unbelievable! That like, I was buzzing for that fight as well because that, after the first fight you wanted, after the result you want you to win. So everybody started backing you. I can even remember when Froch was trying to talk after for everybody was booing and rightly so because it was stopped too fast. But the second fight comes, you've got the confidence, you've got the people behind you. That like, did you get into that fight too overconfident? Then like, what was the preparation for that? Like, did you have new coaches? Like, what was the? No, I kept the same team. Um... It, as I say, it felt like a bit of a whirlwind and, you know, there wouldn't be any time to address any um, because problems. It was, straight, it was only three, four months straight away, was it not, after the first well, fight? Well, the first fight was maybe November, this November 13, and then the, the next fight didn't come around till May the following year, but we'd spent three months negotiating it mm -hmm. and then, the, you know, by then you're right. Well, I'm ticking over training. And then we're 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 into it. We're up, we're on. Um, and training wise, the team hadn't done anything wrong. You know, we were just we were only getting going. Is this what we could produce after ten weeks. We what we're going to be like in the next fight. In the next fight, um, tactics wise, um, 
we were going to sort of build into the fight. And maybe I'd sort of bought into the hype of, I was gassed out, you know, you, you're you going to gas out. So we was like, we won't start with the same intensity that we had in the first fight. We'll build into it. First half, we would just, we'd win the rounds, box clever. And then the second half of the round, we give him hell. Um, but that's kind of a hard, that's, I mean, that's really hard to do. Um, you can do it in boxing, but it's like, you know, it's like anything. If you're a middle distance runner, you don't do the first laps mega slow and then try and sprint the rest. It, you know, you run an even pace race. And what I should have done was just, um, probably should have just started the first fight where the, uh, the second fight where the first fight ended and jump on him and give it to him. Um, that might have put him back into a place that he didn't want to be in. Um, make him go back to his uh, survival instincts or just, to, you know, his, what comes natural to him. Um, and then he's a natural fighter for us. So he'll he'll come out and punch, but he'll punch in positions when he has no right to punch. So that's when you have to take advantage of it. Um, but it was much more tactical in the first fight. And then, um, yeah, I mean, it's the eighth round. You, you make a mistake. And this is boxing now. This is the hardest fight. This is the hardest lesson to learn. The new lesson is that you make a mistake in boxing, you switch off for a second and boom, someone will switch the lights out. And it's not who wants it most. It's not dig deep. And it's like, no, someone shut you down uh, and you haven't got up in time to beat the count. So it's not who wants it most. It's fuck me, you make a mistake. You pay the ultimate price. And that was demoralizing. That was devastating because that's, of course, it was a life's work to that point, but it felt like this is six months, eight months work to date. And I'm now I'm going to be surmised the whole of this saga is going to be, you know, surmised by one punch, which was just heartbreaking. Yeah. So how do you then kick on from that? That like two two defeats, first time you've been put, was that the first time you've been put down? No, I'd got off the floor to win. So I'd boxed... Um, uh, Kenny Anderson, uh, I think he's he's a Glasgow guy. Is he? Really? Yeah, yeah, tough, tough motherfucker. Yeah. yeah. So he won the Commonwealth Games. I bought, so my second, my first defence of the Commonwealth title, but mm -hmm. Kenny Anderson. Did they put you down? On, yeah. Ah, I didn't know that. I <laughs> there thought you go. Yeah. First. No, no, no. So Kenny, uh, I don't know what happened to Kenny. I think he's he's hanging around with some um, dangerous people. So I think he's, I don't know. No one's heard mm -hmm. of him since. But uh, he, uh, yeah, no, real tough guy. Uh, older than me, like mature. Um, just, just walk forward. I was trying to be cute and clever with my floppy hair and da, 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 trying to jab and slip and slide under Adam Booth. And uh, yeah, he just marches me down. Uh, it's me with a, not like a great shot, really. It's sort of like just a concu like concussing shot. I'm just like I'm scramble my brain a bit, sort of go down to the side, get up, and then my legs are just not with me. And then um, I have to just grind it out, grind it out, stop him in the sixth round. Um, thank God. Um, but yeah, off the floor. so I've done off the floor to win, James. Done mm. off the but um, <laughs> this time with Frotch, now nah, it's not off the floor to win. It's uh, off the floor, but you didn't beat the ten count. Yeah, so. but like you say, man, look, that th those two fights obviously not for you, but for the British people to watch that the hype before it was that's what you want to see in it. But how long did you take after that defeat? Did you take some time off, or did you just no, 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 straight back in, straight back in? It was like. Um, got to make up for lost time now straight away yeah pretty much did so you boxed. still believe that you're going to be world champion or did you think things had slipped no no un unwavering self-belief at this point it's like ah oh, fuck me you know uh, new lesson to learn don't switch off for a split second you know but uh we can do um how do we get back in the picture? So uh, Froch had the belts and I think James DeGal was his mandatory. So he was kind of tied up slash we probably thought he was going to retire. Um, so we went from Wembley Stadium at the end of May. Um, I'd signed with the Sowland brothers. So uh, Sowland Promotions, um, Caller and Nissa Sowland. Um, so they pretty much managed me really more than promoting me the next stage of my career. Um we went through the through the, the champions, uh, WBC. They had a great relationship with, um, and they're like, right, we can get you a, a mandatory challenge for the WBC. You can win this next belt, uh, the you know, final eliminator for WBC. We picked this guy, Christopher Brass, who was also a European champion, ranked number three with WBC. So it was like, this is a good fight, good ranking. You know, with your name and your status right now. Uh, this will push you straight in line. So yeah, we went from Wembley Stadium in May to Wembley Arena in September, which was quite a come down. 
Um, went from Sky Box Office doing massive numbers to squeezing onto an Eddie sort of free to air show, which I went to Sky. I mean, I lived not that far from Sky. I knew all the guys at Sky. I went into the head of Sky Sports, sat in his office, and was like, I need a date for my comeback fight. And he's like, talk to Eddie. I was like, mate, come on. Like, I just, um, I've bled for you, like I've bled for you, in and, and um, I like I like I, I like the guy uh, at Sky, and he sort of he just paid out. He's like, look, man, it doesn't matter. Um, talk to Eddie. Uh, I was like, right, cool. So we came away. Uh, Sal and brothers got a great relationship with Eddie Hearn, so you know they managed to get me on the show, but just, just, there's no money there. There's you know, it's now just, it's just we're chasing it. I'm chasing it. Like need to get need to become world champion. Did you like, become desperate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think real desperate at this point. You know. Um, earned good money for the rematch uh so i'm okay for money for a bit i'm not fighting for money right now i'm fighting for the belt you know let's let's take the fights that we need to have to get the belt um win that fight against for brass didn't 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 box to my best i felt a bit flat and a bit stale i think i was carrying a lot of stress you know a lot of stress in that camp coming back after the loss trying to reinvent myself to a certain degree trying to promote myself um without the help of sky or matrim or pretty much anyone with these, these german guys who ain't really got a big influence in the uk worldwide they have they can get me the fights but in terms of promoting me the brand like it was it was tough um so yeah a bit flat trained had to train really hard it was a struggle to make the weight for that fight but european title which is something i'm proud to have won and um yeah, WBC silver title or something, and now I'm back in line for a shot at a world title, which at the, the time was probably vacant. It was, you know, Sakio Bika versus Anthony Durrell for the purest boxing fans of Biana. So your third world title was at Badu Jack? Badu Jack. So by the time that came round, so we boxed September, probably a, it took me about a year to, I had one fight in between, but it took a year to get that challenge. Um, supposed to be in Vegas, uh, at the Cosmopolitan Hotel against Badu Jack um, on a PBC card, um, which was really exciting. I'm going to headline in Vegas. You know, Wembley Stadium, you, you know, we've made history. Uh, so to headline in Vegas, um, it's still not as good as Wembley Stadium, but it's, you know, it's pretty But you'd cool. always done America, like for a, a, a very young in your career. Did you not? You were always there. You fought in undercards of Mayweather and you, you went to America three, four times. Is that correct? Or that? Yeah, so I boxed in America as an amateur three times, like Who, on a London Whose decision select. was that? Yours? To try and crack that? Oh. Well, the um, boxing as an amateur was just a club thing. We went there. Um, and then, yeah, boxing out there in the early part of my pro career was... Um, an advantage through working with David Hay. David Hay was oh, um, under had had a well, he had a, a deal with Golden Boy, whatever deal that was, and I had a great relationship with with Golden Boy. Um, and Robert Diaz in particular used to take care of us, and he used to get me on some undercards. So I boxed on the market Diaz undercard at the, the I think that was at the the, the uh, Mandalay Bay, uh, and I'd boxed that in San Jose. Um, on a Guerrero undercard and that. And then this time, by the time it arrived, it was, this was on the undercard of Floyd Mayweather's at the time, last fight, uh, against Andre Berto. We were chief support, um, at the MGM grand, which was, um, cool. I mean, it was interesting because you're out there for the press workouts and that. And they're like, wow, are you on the undercard of Floyd Mayweather? How does it feel? I was like, it feels pretty shit, mate. Like, I was at Wembley <laughs> Stadium last year. <laughs> you ain't done your research. Uh -huh. Oh, right, you find better Jack. Uh, is it, is it your big step up? Like, well, maybe, but yeah, again, like it's my third world title. <laughs> yeah. So, um, how does that make you feel that like they're not really know who you were? That like you're just they know you as Mayweather's undercard, not realizing you've just done all time figures at in Britain. Like, does that yeah. knock your nah, I was all right, you know, uh -huh. it's okay. At that point, they're Americans, you know, uh, they you know, you leave your ego at the door in that respect, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I mean, fame wise, it, it took off in and around the, the rematch. Um, I remember we actually, I went on holiday to Vegas after uh, Frotch, uh, the Frotch fight with like a bunch of my friends. I took my mom and dad and stuff like that. And then you're, you're fat and out of shape, pasty, laying by the pool, drinking a Bud Light. And then I'd gone from 
like De Gale, after the De Gale fight, people would be really excited to see you. They'd come like, oh, George, how you doing? Da, da, da. And they can have, a, can have a selfie, like, yeah, yeah. Now I'd come to like, maybe I was a bit more unapproachable. And they're like, oh, so the people would be taking a selfie on the sly. It's like your belly's hanging mm. over your shorts. You're like, mate, just come and ask me for a picture. I'll put your fucking phone away. Yeah. I'm not in the mood. <laughs> I'm not happy at the moment. I'm not a nice guy. So, uh, yeah. But yeah, come, come by and then you skip on again another year. Um, that was cool. It was nice. It was, you know, you're trying to, at this point, I'm trying to uh, live my best life and then try and appreciate a little bit as well because um, I didn't appreciate anything to do with, with Wembley because I was so um, focused on the event beforehand um, trying to create something, walking, walking, uh, you know, into the unknown. No, there was no one there I could ask or lean on and say, what's this like? It felt like, you know, we were, we were setting new boundaries. And then afterwards, because it didn't go my way, um, yeah, I, just, I just buried it all, buried it all. You know, memorabilia, that's in the skip, like anything. My my mum my and dad was clawing, um, you know, uh, posters and that out of the bin. Like, no, keep that, you might want it back one day. And then now, yeah, I'm like, where's that pose going? You, you threw it away, <laughs> miserable bastard. What like, made you keep going? I think, I think at this point, I mean, so... Uh, I'm chasing it. I'm chasing up to Badu Jack and then I go to Vegas and I fight and I put everything in. It's like, it is all, all or nothing at this point. We're in California for seven weeks training. Same six team. weeks. Same team. Paddy. Paddy. Um, Paddy. And at this point, Paddy, I'd sort of lost a bit of confidence in Paddy. Um, because of the defeats? Yeah. Well, not even, yeah, the defeats. But then I had another fight after that and I hadn't boxed too well after the Rebrass fight. So the, so the first fight was great. Second fight, box okay next fight not great and then the last fight not great at all so it was like i felt like i was even though i won the last two i was kind of not really performing and um i didn't really give him any any uh any sympathy or i suppose him is the right word. i didn't really give him any any you know allowance for the fact that this is big for him too. You know what I mean? I've took, I've, I've plucked him out of his amateur club and then I've said, right, come, come with me to this pay-per-view massive fight in Manchester. Oh, and then from there, we're going into a post-war attendance record, biggest fight in British boxing and never gave him any allowance for, is he up for this challenge? Like, is he capable of this? Um, so ultimately, I'm, I'm the man in the arena. Like, it's up to me. I've got to perform. So, um, yeah, but at that point, I didn't. I, I I felt like I needed I needed someone else apart from Paddy. I didn't want to get rid of Paddy, but I wanted someone else. I wanted someone to bounce ideas off. Um, but I just too scared to make a change. You know, I'd made this change leaving Adam before the first fight, and it hadn't worked out. Uh, so I couldn't do the same again. I didn't know where to go, who to speak to, what to do. So we went through with it. And do you lose confidence in making uh, decisions? Yeah, at that point, you you like. You know, um, you're disappointed with yourself after. Uh, you're like, you're really disappointed in yourself. That, I mean, that was my lowest point, losing the Battle Jack. I've gone from uh, sort of breezing through the first loss, being rock bottom after the second loss, thinking that's it. And then the third loss, I describe it as now you're thinking about your life instead of boxing rather than your life after boxing. You know, you might have plans for your life after boxing, uh, but now it's like, I'm not going to be a boxer anymore and I still haven't done what I set out to do. So what the fuck does that mean? Like, and then I toyed with that idea for a little bit. Um, not on, it felt like a long time at the time, James, you know, you feel like you've been stewing on it for years, but actually retrospectively it, it was only probably only eight weeks. Uh, and then I started looking, I was like, no, I'm fucking, I'm going to be a champion, world champion. Now I've got to be the best. I can't leave this sport without becoming a world champion. That is how I'm going to measure success. Um, when you're a kid, when you're seven years old, when I first dreamt about being a boxer, I wanted to be the world champion. I wanted to be the best fighter in the world. Um, and then skip forward, you, you, you know, you grow up, you want a car, you want a nice house, you want this, you want that. All that you got, you got a wife, you got kids, you got responsibilities now. You know, you want money, you want the, all these other things came into play. And then I went full circle. Like I'm measuring my success now. Fuck the rest. Like it's I'm gonna become a world champion. I can't leave the sport without that. So. Um, Trialed out a few coaches, found Shane McGuigan, um, who was training Carl Frampton at the time, uh, who was, I think, a world champion at the time. Uh, and he had a bunch of great fighters in the gym with him. So there was Josh Taylor, who's 
probably only like one and oh, two and oh. Comrade Cummins and and uh, I can't remember who else was in there, but there was a few in there. Uh, it was a great environment for training. Um, yeah, Barry McGuigan there, who's just had been there, done it, which was reassuring for me. You know, I'd you know he'd been involved in the big fights, had a lot of experience. Um, Shane said the right things, you know, the right things that worked for me, and was like, right, that's it, man. We'll go again. We'll, we will go again. Uh, this time we'll learn from our mistakes. We won't be chasing it like it felt like from Frotch 2, chasing it to the Badu Jack fight. Now we can step back, relax a little bit, learn from our mistakes um, and push on and can make it work this time. And what was the plan from the Badu Jack defeat to get another world title shot? Like, did you have, get another two or three fights, build up your confidence, then we'll go for another title? Or was it just trying to get you straight back in for another title shot? Mm. Yeah, I mean the way it, the way it sort of panned out was that uh, yeah I I was still signed with um, the Saulan brothers uh, and they as I say they pretty much picked up a lot of the management side of things because I didn't actually fight on one of their shows again. Uh, first fight out was uh, January uh, on a Matchroom show on Sky, so I'm back in familiar territory. It was in London at the Copper Box, you know MGM Grand Mayweather. Copper box, January, it's cold. <laughs> Everyone's fucking stuffed, stuffed with turkey and hung over and they're waiting for their January paycheck to come in. It wasn't, we didn't, we didn't set the world alight that, that night in terms of, you know, rocketing ticket sales and everything, but back to winning ways, back main event, back in London, back on the road to, you know, uh, becoming a world champion. So we had that. Then we was out on two Joshua undercards, um, chief support. So back in the public eye, second one was against Martin Murray, who's, like me, a former world title challenger who hadn't quite got over the line, um, and it was billed as a 50-50 fight. We, you know, I think people, a lot of people thought it was going to be fifty-fifty, um, but we was in good shape. I thought it's going to be a comfortable fight. Beat Martin really, really comfortably, um, and that was the, the that was a final eliminator for the WBA. So now we're back in that position where I've just got to wait for the WBA to sort itself out. But in theory, my next fight could be for a world title. So. I'm there, I'm there. I just don't mm -hmm. fuck it up this time, you know? And what happens then when you get the fourth call, another world title coming up? What are you thinking? You, like, obviously, you've, your whole career, you've been confident. The losses, the setbacks, the fucking management, it, it knocks fuck out. You, it, I'd imagine it would drain you, but the fourth fight, that world title coming up, your fourth opportunity, like, how are you going into that? You, do you get overconfident or do you get you know what, fuck it, I've got my family, I've got my kids, I've got roof over my head, food in my belly, Let's just enjoy this experience. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. This was this was like this was uh this this. If it doesn't happen now, I, d I don't think I could have emotionally gone again. You know, um, and I definitely didn't want to be famous for for not getting over the finish line. This was uh this had to be like this. I had to make this work. Um, I was I was confident. I was really confident. Um, but not maybe slightly different in that not like absolutely cocksure of like this is this is my time like you like i had in, in the first two frotch fights it was more like you know prepare to best your abilities go out there and box out of your skin and let's hope it let's hope it fucking happens <laughs> yeah it's like because anything can happen in boxing you know mm -hmm. um anything can happen in boxing i'd signed into this tournament so the world boxing super series had been set up and they wanted like it was set up with Kala Saulan, who was obviously my promoter, he had sort of left um, Saulan to join the World Boxing Series. And he's on the, the hunt for sign up a bunch of fighters. Season one, they want to do super middleweights, because of me, and they want to do cruiserweights because they know they can get me in straight away. And if I win my world title, then they've got a world champion straight away signed into their tournament. And, you know, if I'm, they, they launch from me that would be easier for them to sign up other champions or other big names. That was like a great fucking series, man. So, yeah, it was a good series. series. So I'm like, they're like, uh, this. all this chat happened before the the Tudinov fight, before the world title fight. Um, and I worked it out. Like, I had two contracts, one going in as world champion, one as not. World champion going as number one seed and you've got, life-changing money like guaranteed for your first fight second one i think it was like a 19th of the purse like i was like i was back to i mean i don't think i would have i wouldn't have even have fought for that much money but just the contrast in what they were you're like 
fucking hell like wow uh there's there's a lot on the line here so not only do i need to win this world title for my own sanity also this world title genuinely does put me on the path to the end of my career leaving the sports happy and satisfied um and it's a it's, it's a it's one of them fights like uh if you've seen the fight you'll know there's um Chudinov don't look too much on paper he don't look too much even in person but um, just a fucking hard, hard <laughs> bastard, man. They, and I'd, luckily for me, I'd been in them fights. I'd been in them fights, so I could, and I got the experience to stay relatively calm. Um, uh, he, but the, th the third round, he sort of rolls a right hand over the top, and at this point, I've got no real bearing in the fight. I haven't really put a proper dent in him. I'm confident that worst comes to worst, I can see this fight out. You know, beating him on points, but this ain't an easy night's work. He rolls the right hand over and um, I hear a big crack on this side of my mouth and I'm like, he's broke my jaw. Like I broke my jaw 10 years earlier. I was like, I know this feeling. And then I can just feel my mouth um, filling up with blood. Um, I thought, oh, well, fuck it. It's, you're in it now. Whatever. That'll do. Um, don't let him hit you again. Uh, I sit down. I don't tell any of the corner. I thought, I don't really need them panicking. <laughs> I don't want them telling me something that because of their reaction to that. So anyway, I was like, stoic. Shane McGuigan goes to take my gum shield out. I'm like, that's nah, all right, leave it. <laughs> it's not coming out. It's wedged in. Um, the next round, he catches me another right hand, I think, cut over this eye. So blood's pouring into the eye. And you're taught early on, like, don't wipe the blood away from your eye because you're giving the referee an excuse to stop the fight. But at this point, I'm like, well, fuck it. You know, I've got to see him. I <laughs> can't not see him. So I'm trying to dab the, the blood away. Um fifth round i haven't really got got him he, he might even do quite well in the fifth round he might just ramp up the pressure um and then the sixth round starts i just cliche me just sort of bounce off the back leg just roll a right hand over the top momentarily stun him and he's like then it's like hitting one of them dolls you know one <laughs> them dummies i'm just keep hitting him nothing's happening nothing's moving him but i just um just keep just keep punching until the referee stops it and then luckily he does he sort of falls into me um the referee pulls us apart and then it's like three more big digs and then uh uh steve ray waves off the waves off the fight and then it's like oh, i can breathe you know it's been years like three and three and a half years i think in the making i've been waiting for this and i can just like oh, breathe a sigh of relief and i could put to bed all the trauma all the all the anguish all the paranoia all the the hate and bitterment and, and resentment that I've got for all these people and everyone else involved in boxing in general, uh, I can just be like, oh, that's what I do. I mean, always stress, James. Always stress. But first thing I think it also is like, shit, I'm supposed to be boxing in about 12 weeks, like in this World Series, and I've got a broken jaw. But um, I will fucking we'll really enjoy it tonight. We'll sort that problem out in the morning. Could you not enjoy it because you know you're going straight back into more fucking grenades like because the fighters that were on that series you had was it Callum Smith Eubank Jr like phenomenal fighters like mm. seeing you win that world title like you say it was a relief but could you enjoy it like everything you've worked for like did it make sense then mm. or did it still not make sense yeah no I think I think it did make sense um, but it's not like and it it's, it's, it's more like a relief a relief um, feeling like rather than a joyous jumping up and down celebrating like i think that them 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 sort of reactions come when you haven't necessarily faced any real um hardship or adversity or, or just been down and defeated you know like um but when you've had to slug back you know like at the fourth attempt um finally make it it is just a, a massive sigh of relief the weight of the world had been lifted from my shoulders um and then as time goes on it just I see things differently. I see things, you know, real diff differently. Um, I probably became um, a totally different fighter after that. You know, I still had three more fights to have, but, um, you know, the same, I, I can honestly say the same desire, it, you know, it leaves you. You know, you, you, you've you you've completed the, the challenge, you know, like it's, it's been done. So, um, I mean, I knew my time was numbered in boxing. Like I've been looking at exit strategies for years out of um, frustration, you know, like just, oh, I fucking hate this thing. You know, every time, you know, oh, you just time to go your way. But at this point it's like, oh, you know, I, you know, am I, um, 
my life's changed now. I am, well, I'm in, uh, I'm in that club. I'm in the club and I can, I can leave the sport happy, which something that I wasn't sure I'd be able to do for, for a large period of, of my career. But now I know I can. How did your mum and dad react? Like when you, you become this boy comes world champion, like everything that you've tried to achieve, like the ups, the downs, the losses, think you'll never ever get there. But obviously speaking to you now, you've always believed that you would get there. So fair play to that. But mm. how did your parents react to something like that? Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> like, they, I mean, they, I'm not. I'll say I believed it, but not everyone else around mm -hmm. me maybe believed it. Um, I think they they're really happy for me. Um, I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure they were really happy for me. They've they've said the same. I don't. I think boxing for them just got so intense, you know, like over the years. Uh, and then the harder it got for me, that just it, the more unbearable it got for them. Um, do you think it takes its toll on them seeing you suffer and lose oh yeah, yeah definitely I mean suffer and win sometimes but um, yeah you know there, there were fights where my mum couldn't come or my dad wouldn't come like, I'd always have tickets for him but I think it was just like the you know I aged them a lot in the in the process because um, you know they, they were there from the start and they're your biggest fans at times and um, yeah they uh, I think yeah I think it's happy memories. I mean, they they, they let them, they love boxing more than me. You know, like if you go around, they've got the boxing on more often than I have. And, uh, all, you know, all my fights, they're just typical parents in there. So all my fights are on the, the sky box and, you know, they probably roll them out. Embarrassingly, when people come over, you're like, oh, Dad, don't watch that. <laughs> <laughs> my four-year-old four will be in there and yeah. it's like, Dad, turn the, mm -hmm. turn the tune off fight off. Like, my kids looking at you like that. It's yeah. like, you, Dad, like, that's not me. <laughs> so you've won the world title. You've achieved everything you've set out to do in boxing like you say you feel as if you've completed that did that take pressure off you get into the super series yeah and no, i did it really did it really did i mean now uh i can have fun and leave from the front and um still 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 like be who i am you know i'm like right okay uh they said you're gonna you get to pick who you want to fight first so it's like uh four seeded versus four unseeded so i can pick who i want out of the unseeded and i picked jamie cox who we used to be mates i mean we are i mean we're not mates now because we don't see each other but we used to share a room together but he used to be a light weltweight when i knew him now he's like ballooned up now he's um he's like a super middleweight and he was unbeaten and he could punch southpaw not like the easiest fight to pick um but i felt like uh, I, I knew enough about him that I'll have a bit of a bit of Jamie, so yeah, and I'd, I sort of planned it so that I would meet Eubank in the semi-finals because um, seed one could fight seed three or four, and I was like, well, make sure I'm fighting whatever seed Eubank was because I wanted to get him in the semi-finals. Um, Why? It was more money. Why was that? <laughs> I can't go into detail, but there was a. It was like he could. He, there could have been an easy fight. I think it was either him or Jurgen Bremer. Like Jurgen Bremer's. I think he's he would have been in his 40s by then so he might have been the easier fight but Eubank I'd done a lot of rounds with him I knew it'd be fun I knew it'd be interesting uh, I like the Eubanks I like the dad he's an interesting character uh, Ronnie who used to train him at the time uh, yeah I was just I was up I was up for that so um, yeah we negotiated uh, Eubank in uh, and then it was um, whoever got through the final it turned out to be Callum Smith Um how so, does yeah. that work with that super series? So have you got to negotiate contracts before the fights or does it you negotiate negotiate after each fight? Uh so no no no. So you sign in before you before you go. So in. you're in no matter so what. So that's that's why it's quite difficult for the for the company, the the promoters to actually get a lot of fighters in because a lot of fighters are you try and get an American world champion, they don't want to sign away for free fights. They and not not so much but free fights as in you're going to fight this guy this guy this guy and the likelihood is that each of these free fights is going to be hard and get harder as you go along like some fighters they might they might not mind a, a hard world title fight but then they want a nice easy to first defense or whatnot but that's how that's how that tournament works and um they've got i don't know they've been, they've been hanging around waiting for season three but i think they've got an all-female season three coming out soon which might be good, might not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the level yeah. of the, the competition. Who I'm not even sure what weight it is. But um, the concept's great. 
I thought it Concerts was brilliant. Great, I remember man. going to the cinema and watching that weird in Glasgow. They, yeah. they had you and Eubank, me and my big friend Barry watched that. <laughs> because I think when the Eubank, like, were you nervous of that fight? Because obviously a younger kid, like, it was, I think he'd nah. only lost one to Billy Joel Saunders, Billy yeah. Joel Saunders at the time. Like, were you feeling confident getting into that fight as well? Yeah, no, supremely confident. I mean, I, I was a lot bigger than Eubank. Um, were you a favourite at that fight? No, he was. So you're I again, think you're underdog. This is underdog madness. I, that was the one that really confused me. I was like, what? Um, but they'd done a, an incredible marketing job on Eubank at the time. His dad was telling everyone he's the best thing the, ever. The best His thing dad's ever. class. He's a funny dad, bastard. Brilliant. He's a clever man and he's an um, interesting man. Um, and I hope he's okay, you know, like um, with the loss of his son. But, you know, he puts on a facade to a certain degree, but it's the facade he wants to put on, um, Senior. But it, the facade is that he shows no weakness, you know, like. Um, so there's something. I have I've bought into at times. Um but you know, I didn't, we've all get flaws, yeah, aren't we? Yeah, no, sure. I mean I didn't show any vulnerability until winning the world title. And then people like people stop me now and go, Oh, I like you know, afterwards it's like, wow, you know, I saw a human side to you. It's like, <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, I'm <laughs> fucking human. Yeah. Uh and then it's funny and people talk talk to me now and they're like, Oh, you know, when you was boxing, I just thought you was weird. I was like, weird? It's like, yeah, I thought you was weird. I was like, why? What was weird? I don't know, just the way you were weird. I was like, mm. But I suppose I did come across different to a lot of people because that was just the way I the way I thought was the best result. I was happy to, you know, come across a certain way if I thought it would give me an advantage in a fight. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'd love to be a stand-up comedian. Love, <laughs> that would be the dream. <laughs> Fucking just make people laugh. But then at the same time, it wouldn't work because halfway through I go, I don't even fuck what you people think anyway. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's kind of who I, who I am. But maybe that's how a lot of fighters are. Yeah. I spend a lot of time with Carl Froch now and he reminds me of that sometimes yeah. where he don't give a shit what he says, how he thinks, how he treats people. But then something will click one bit and he's like, he feel bad about something or he'll not necessarily regret something, but you think maybe I should play that a little bit different. Um, Do you think that's a persona though most boxers have because they're known as fighters, manly men? Like, do you think that's all? Well, uh, like you say, Chris Eubank Senior, that like, you've got to put on that, but realizing that we're all fucking human, we all bleed the same, like we all struggle, we all have our moments. But do you think as a boxer you have to be that extra little bit tougher to not show much emotion? Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. I think so. I think that's that's the job. I think I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't uh, have it any other way, really. You know, you got, you got. It's, it's a tough sport. It's physically demanding, mentally demanding, and emotionally demanding because um, it's it's your own personal emotions of you know combat sport. Someone's trying to hurt you. You're trying to hurt them. You know, that's that's weird, really. And if you take it out of boxing in any other context that isn't like a sport. It's a bit weird. And then you've got the emotional element of family members. So as you grow up and you become more more aware, you know, you might have a partner or kids. And then as soon as that happens, you usually soften. Uh, and then you're more aware of what your parents might have been feeling, you know, while you was fighting, what your your loved ones, your close your close friends and stuff like that. So uh it's a it's tough fight. It's tough it's tough in that respect. But then at the same time, you want to be uh, the man in the arena, you gotta get on with it. I think you gotta be you gotta be tough. Like um it's good. It's it's good. It's good. It's good to be tough. You know, it's good. It's good to be resilient. Yeah, you've got to have that bit of grit to kick on. See your fight with the German kids at Eduardo or something. Like, how did you handle that? Like with the the brain swearing. With yeah. Them? So I boxed. I boxed Eddie Goodnight. Um, was it? What was his name? Uh, yeah. Ed. Ed, Ed I could oh, call yeah, him yeah. Eddie. Mm -hmm. uh, it might have been Edward Goodnight. He uh, rush a uh, German based fight I can't remember where he's from but um we had a fight it was after the Martin Murray fight before the Tudor fight so the fight before I fight for a world title I box um Eddie in a keep busy fight really it's on channel five it's WBA is taking a long time let's have a ch uh, another fight keep busy a little bit of money comes in um and yeah we box it goes the full 12 rounds he's never really in the fight I land some some big shots on him, but nothing to really stop him, prompt the referee to stop him. I think the referee could have done him a favour or more likely the corner should have done him a favour. But that's all hindsight. 
uh, and then he collapses in the changing room. Um, I remember being in my changing room and my physio came over and sort of whispered like, Eddie's collapsed in the changing room. And you you know what that means. You're like, that's bad. Um, it's got to be really bad for them to come and tell me. So, um, yeah, they rushed him off to hospital. Uh, he has a bleed on the brain. I think they put him in an induced coma, um, probably operate on him. Uh, I go and visit him. Um with Nissa Sowland, say on the Wednesday, maybe. Um, he's in Paddington Hospital in London. And uh, yeah, I mean, he was he was like a shell of the man that he was Saturday. It was, for me, crazy. I couldn't believe that someone could deteriorate that much over four days. And now his wife's over, or yeah, his wife, his sister, and his brother, and his dad. And they were, they were really nice and, to me, which, you know, um, harbored no resentment. They're like, it's boxing, we understand. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that brought it to home because um, and he's got three kids, you know, he's got three kids at home and he's over here just trying to earn a living and um, he would never be the same again. At this time, they don't even know if he's going to wake up um, since he is awake, but he's not the same. You know, he can barely walk, he can barely talk. Um, he made improvements, but that might be as far as he's going to go. So um, yeah, it's tough. I, I, was a, I was a dad at the time. Um, and then you realize when you're a dad, you're not exactly fighting. It's not, it's not for yourself anymore. You fight for your family. Like, uh, I'm not, I'm not really willing to go out on my shield, uh, quite the same as, as I used to before. I'm not going to die for the cause. I'm not going to die for the people. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was really tough. I mean, then, then and there, I'm like, my days are numbered in boxing. It's not why I got into boxing. Um, at that stage of my career, it was, yeah, it was it was it was really tough. You know, really, really tough because you're like, yeah, you 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 got, I don't know, I don't know. You got like a maybe an element of guilt, but also you're like a sport, so you don't feel guilty, but you do feel yeah. bad. <clears throat> it's like caught in the middle, and yeah. it? like it's a box at the end of the day. As people say, it's box at the end of the day. You signed up for that, but it's the emotional thing to see that man with his kids and his wife, and one day it potentially could be you. Mm. as well that it's a total like nobody's ever it's hard for people to explain if they've never been in that predicament to see somebody like but like you say it, it's like you book this box and that you love you know what people get involved in but to still see that it doesn't really fucking take it away that it's happened do you know what i mean but then again you've won the world title you've went on you fought you bank that like, that was an unbelievable fight like did he not he had his eye cut you dislocated your shoulder like because you'd won that, did you know you were coasting that fight the last few rounds? Like, how did you prepare for that? Because he comes out, he's non-stop punching. Like, did you know what he was going to do? Also, yeah, no, we had, we had our game plan. We was going to keep it sort of on our terms. Um, don't need to sort of necessarily sit in the pocket and trade with him because um, he does have a good engine. He does throw his shots technically pretty sound in the pocket, bent arm shots, and. Um, He's just going to be, he can't compete with me at, at sort of the, the long to mid range. So that was what we were going to do. Because um, your jab was class that fight, eh? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you, you always want to control control a guy with a jab, dictate with a jab. The other shots can come off of that. Um, and he just give him no bearing in the fight. Um, he's He would be, you'd imagine that also that his game plan was to sort of try and wear me down and, and try and get me late. I mean, that's what everyone, I was my paranoia that everyone would think they could, have success in that respect um and more so than anything even if i knew that that wasn't the case i don't really want that i don't really want this little guy all jacked up from round eight thinking oh, i'm gonna get him now i'm like oh, can we not just like <laughs> touch and pull and move around um but yeah no i, I mean I, I wanted to get rid of him but there was a there was this weird element of this being a semi-final a final's coming it's big money in the final like don't fuck this up because the final was there. And as I say, I know I'm on a ticket. Like, I was signed into that tournament. Uh, it was three fights. It's supposed to be in the space of 12 months. And that was me out, out of the game. If I'd lost in the first fight, that would probably be me out of the game. Second fight, third fight. So, you know, just get just get through, win, do well. Um, you are, it's weird. At this point, I'm just, yeah, end goals in sight. You know, let's go. Um, 
dislocate the shoulder in the last round, which is beneficial for me that not being the, the first round. And it, I assume it's like a wear and tear injury. It might have happened a little bit in the in the camp building up, but literally I punched my own shoulder out of <laughs> out of his socket <laughs> in the uh, in the twelfth round. I sort of maybe at the end of the eleventh, um, I feel something weird, like a maybe a partial dislocation or something. And then I remember it popping out and back in in the twelfth, and thinking, oh, that's a bit gnarly. I don't like that. Don't throw a, don't throw any uh, any more power shots or any more hooks. So then, but the next jab that comes out, it just comes out, um, and then I try and get it back in, and it won't go back in. I was like, well, this is cool. Hopefully, everyone can see that I've got a dislocated shoulder at this point, and not that um, I'm just doing something weird <laughs> at mm. the end of the fight. So um, yeah, when I mean, it just adds to the to the drama of a lot of my fights which is kind of cool how was it what beating your bank junior yeah cool i mean nice again like again underdog yeah underdog i mean that was like a bit bizarre how they sort of they sort of sold him but great i mean good to get the win and new bank's a solid fighter a good fighter you know he's a good ambassador of the sport he's a uh a professional like he, he lives and breathes it so uh i was really happy with the win but likewise, like when I broke my jaw winning the belt and I've got to prepare for a fight, I'm in the final of this tournament and I've got a dislocated shoulder. And already, before I've even got to the hospital, like my agents are arguing with the promoters because they want this fight to take place in a certain amount of day and da 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 da. It ain't going to happen. So we had a, a massive stress, like a huge stress, just to be in the final, um, which took months to sort out. So that our fight was in, in uh, February. And I probably didn't start training properly till the end of July, just because it's hard to get your head switched on for a camp until the fight date is set and you're into it. At the same time, I'm in agony trying to rehabilitate a shoulder, flying out to Berlin to get assessments for the tournament, um, flying here for specialist rehab up, you know, in my physio's office four times a night, uh, four times a week, you know, in Soho trying to get, um, the range back and get the strength back in it switch the nerve endings back in back on and stuff like that so that was a torrid time maybe that helped me in in the retirement process like because that was such a stressful hard camp like that took it, it did take a lot out of me i think um just rushing maybe if i'd sort of said right dislocated shoulder give yourself 12 months to come back rather than give myself three months to come back why did you rush up because i wanted to make that final i was just that was my end goal that was it i'm boxing this final um when i lose were you going to retire anyway or you've had another couple if you'd won no i, I planned i mean you I never said you know you it's hard to tell but the dream was to win the t win the tournament and then retire there was there there might have been a De Gale fight after there might have been a canelo fight after but this was before canelo had come up to super middleweight and james de Gale, um had the ibf but had a mandatory and a few others so there was there was talk of me pulling out the tournament and fighting the gale keeping the belt so i would have come out with my own world title and fighting the gale or stuff like that but it was just back to the back 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 to work in terms of promoting this promoting a fight selling a pay-per-view getting fit and healthy doing this doing that rolling the dice on is it going to be a success or not and uh, by then, I just I was happy with what I had. I was you like, becoming I was it becoming tired, tiresome. It sounds fucking tiresome. I mean, it is. Yeah, it is. I mean, it it is, and it, it was, and this is almost feels like uh, a ten year grind now. Um, mm. And as I say, as an amateur, I lived and breathed it. As a little kid, I, I went twenty eight and zero as an amateur. As a kid, like I only got beat when I started boxing for England, and they sent me to like in Russia and places like that and fighting these these uh hairy ass eastern <laughs> europeans yeah bashing bashing <clears throat> fuck out of us yeah. but um yeah so like i was on it from the get-go you know like so i had a 10-year career that was a, a hectic 10 years um but i'd been a amateur for 10 years as well where i felt like i'd been pushing it so by this point yeah i think i am tired i've got two two beautiful boys at this point two under two for the last the last camp uh mother-in-law and father-in-law have moved into the house to help help mum deal with pregnant end of pregnancy with a tiny toddler as well as you know post post birth and i'm sort of trying to sleep through baby crying and stuff like that so uh it was 
Yeah, no, it was t- And then they sent us to Saudi Arabia, which was fun as well. Mm. Yeah. How was it retiring? Like, what did you, you only had 28 professional fights. How many professional fights did you have? Uh, I think, I think I had, yeah, just over 30. I think I had 28 wins maybe and, thir- and four losses. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Um, retirement was okay. I mean, I was ready for it. Well, yeah. I think I was ready for it. It wasn't like, um, just arrived at my lap for an injury or fizzled out through um, lack of opportunity or something like that. Um, I remember uh, my agent, Dean, at, at Wasserman was, uh, I'm sure there was an opportunity to fight Billy Joe Saunders um, for a vacant WBO world title uh, that Frank Warren was pitching our way. Um, I was like, nah, man, I'm retired. I've had enough. <laughs> I can't face another camp. Like uh, The shoulder still wasn't right which was cool. Um, so I just had fun. Like I was in the gym for the first time we could turn off the, uh, turn off the pressure cooker, you know, like you, you, you always got to be on it. Like that's what I realized through retirement. You've always got to be on it. Uh, and the, the difference between needing to and wanting to is night and day. Like now I can want to get to 12 stone, but it ain't happening like because uh, i want to but if i need to get to 12 stone i fucking will get there like mm-hmm. i have to do it you know um and there's think there's this just this is retirement is is a blessing if you can find sort of a bit of contentment and in contentment i mean happiness you know uh and i am i feel i feel, I, I feel i'm happy you know i'm feeling happy as i possibly could could have been um you know i've got lovely people around me um I'm happy at home and I can dip my toe into the boxing world as and when I choose, which is is so much better for me right now than the constant pressure of being the man in the arena. That, you will miss that. You Of course, you'll miss like fucking the spotlight on you and leading from the front, but it does come at a cost. You know, you, you can't have your cake and eat it. You can't be, you know, I can't be the best possible dad I want to be if I'm going to now disappear and go into camp. Because if a fight comes up, I'll probably go to LA for six months, you know, or yeah. or, or take myself to the other side of the country or something, you know, um, to, to, to live mm-hmm. live and be all in. Like, um, so I like retirement. What do you miss the most about that? Probably just punching people in the face. <laughs> like, it sounds bizarre, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there is that one-on-one owning owning someone you know uh in in combat which is which is nice you know um just better better in someone um and you get to my age and, and you realize you are you are you sort of all in for the boxing you know all my skill sets revolve around boxing all my knowledge revolves around boxing um and i did figure i'd have time to maybe get good at something else retiring at 30 i was like i can throw myself in something else 20 years that might be good might learn to play chess or learn to sing and dance or do something but the truth is you can't be bothered to do anything yeah. else you're like i'm gonna box i know boxing so now i get to do boxing related stuff like started a podcast now yeah following what's the podcast your, we'll plug look straight away but following your footsteps so we've got the george Groves boxing mm-hmm. club podcast which is out like we do a weekly show uh, one goes out every week where we get a boxing person someone a, a member of the boxing community to come in and talk about a boxing related subject and hopefully it's a little bit different a little bit uh and it is interesting for the listener in that we sure we'll have current fighters coming on talking about something in particular but then we all have we've had trainers or we've had shane mcgregor come on talk about pad work we've had um mike costello come in and talk about the chaos of ringside being you know on the comms he's the lead commentator for the zone now we've had um the Azim brothers on talking about what it's like to be a prospect, you know, and there's a few, there's a few that are coming out, uh, real soon as well. So I think Frank Smith, the CEO of match and boxing came out, uh, this week, he's on talking about money. So everyone wants to know about money, who's getting what, uh, how much is really there. So, um, yeah, no, this is, this is fun. This is something, the project that, um, I'm interested in that hopefully, uh, has some legs and will go somewhere and then, yeah, uh, and Bill from him following your foot. Yeah, so good on you. Days, if you need yeah. any advice, bro, listen, yeah, no, I'm here on my phone good. call. Away. <laughs> What's the hardest thing about being a boxer? Um, probably the dis like it's the discipline that then comes with the the pressure. Um, 
maybe 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 it's that I mean, it might be different for a few people but um you if you want to be the very best version of yourself then there are you can't you can't really cheat in in any in any way so you're missing out on the sometimes the important stuff you know the family occasions you might have to miss weddings and christenings and funerals and stuff like that you might have to uh just compromise your relationships you know some friendships because you're not cutting friends out of your life it's just that you're choosing boxing over them so you're not going out on a friday night or a saturday night you you can't come to their birthday you can't you can't do anything you know uh they'll be you know family my wife's family they're all amazing cooks every one of them but if they used to invite me around on a saturday i'm not going because i can't be around that food and that temptation and it took a long time for i i think them to understand that um my father-in-law um had been involved in some of the camps like he was a big help when i uh, when i first fought frot she would pick the sparring partners up for me and drive them to the gym and stuff like that. so then he, all of a sudden he's hanging out watching the sessions in the gym and he's like newfound respect for me he's like no nah, leave george alone he's not eating that uh the <laughs> he's not eating the chicken uh the chicken cheese and rice this week he's gonna got to make weight uh, so yeah i think that's pro probably one of the toughest things in boxing getting punched in the face and putting yourself through hell like that's the, in the gym that's easy like that's all day yeah. every day you seem to have had a career lasted in 10 years in the pro game like you seem to have been everywhere when, you, when it was your fights there was big hype about it like so fair play for winning your world title, for winning your belts, for setting out everything. Like for any boxer watching or any kid, like my young nephew is a boxer, he just get carded there, he's got his first amateur fight coming uh, up. Good like, lad, yeah. yeah. Keep your chin down, keep your fist tight. There you go. <laughs> yeah, young Carter, man. Like I've got big hopes for him, but for anybody that's watching, it's maybe just struggling in life. Like You've got a man who's struggled, came back, struggled some more, came back even stronger. Like what advice would you give for anyone who's struggling? Yeah, so I mean, it's a to give a con a quick condensed answer. But um, I have a talk. I talk about how to become a champion. So it's um, it's built around these seven key traits of a champion. But essentially, it is unwavering self belief, which I've spoke about all the way through here. So believe in yourself and resilience, because it won't always go your way. So if you can combine both of them two and they will feed into each other at times, um, you'll get to where you need to go. And if you're in a, if you're in a dark place, um, boxing's actually not a bad thing to have a go at. You know, and James, I know you've, you've had, you've had your, your fight, you would have done your camp. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, it's not ideal for kids to get punched in the face, of course, right? But it's one of them sports where if they take to it, um, you, it's hard to, to go uh, be led astray because you you have to sacrifice so much for it that there's so much to, to to lose that you you end up not really wanting to stray from that and that's i think that's why it's addictive boxing in particular for all walks of life you know um my gym my amateur gym uh is in La uh, labrick grove notting hill an affluent area of, of west london so you've got riffraff like me and a few others riffraff from one side but then you've got some of the richest people in the country the other and we all they all mix they're all in the same sort of gyms because it's it's a sport that can really appeal to everyone and as you say if you're gonna if you're gonna prepare for a fight wow you're not cheating on the mills you're not going out with your mates anymore you are making some sacrifices and making them sacrifices sometimes will give you the confidence and the belief to uh, feel good about yourself so uh i think yeah i think uh, i'm not saying start boxing but d definitely find a hobby that might require some sacrifices that therefore you can start feeling good yeah. about yourself for uh, making that commitment you've got your tour with frotch as well coming up like where can people get your tickets yeah so get onto mac maker promotions uh website and he'll he'll sort you out of a ticket he it seems like he'll always squeeze another table in for you so there's always a ticket <laughs> available uh yet yet to sell out completely i think but um yeah we're on tour we've done we've done not in them already uh carl's hometown which was good good fun got up there i tried to charm the pants off of everyone in there met carl's mum. she's a lovely lady i thought she was going to dislike me but she didn't uh carl's brother lee's always there but he's uh he's good fun um it was a great room nice people very well dressed which was nice you could tell when when people have made a real effort then they come for a good night uh we're in leicester tomorrow 
and we got Newcastle, Scotland, London, a bunch of other Bournemouth, I think, and a few others. So yeah, f- get on, get on the website, find a, a town or city close to you, come down, have a laugh. Definitely, I'll- we will leave all the links in the description. Georgie, listen for coming Lovely. on and telling your story, brother. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Phenomenal career, mad stories, mad fights, but you came out the other end, and now you're here to tell the tale, brother. But God bless you. I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you, James. Thank, Thank you. you.